Tim Lampley along with Bob Golick back in Houston. And quickly, let's take a look at the list of teams still eligible for the wild card race in the AFC. And surely, Bob, Houston is the only entry here to have lost its last four games at home. Yeah, they really have. But they've been close. I mean, they've felt good about some of the games, even though it has put them in bad, a bad situation where they are not in control of their own destiny. They could have been 10 and 4. They could have been 11 and 3 had it not been for a couple of mistakes in the kicking game. A couple of turnovers here and there. Locked field goal versus Seattle. The interception uh, in the Miami game by Zach Thomas. Things like that really put him on a, in a bad situation. Lee Johnson kicking it away for the Bengals. Mel Gray goes into the end zone and decides to bring it back. Gray averaging nearly 25 yards per kickoff return. And he shows the moves that have made him one of the great kick returners in the history of the league. Andre Collins makes the stop. After a 26-yard return, Oilers will start with pretty good field position near the 30-yard line. And as Chris Chandler comes onto the field, he'll be operating behind the two pro bowlers in the middle of the offensive line for the Oilers. The Oilers have stayed pretty healthy in that category all year long. Eddie George, the rookie running back, is the key to the offense. Chris Sanders is close to the top of the league in yards for reception when they go to the three-wide. Ronnie Harmon is the third down back. And Derek Russell is the third wide receiver. First down 10 from the 29-yard line to give us to George. The Bengals are looking for him, and he's immediately met for the loss of a yard by the strong safety number 27, Bracey Walker. Quick look at the Cincinnati Bengals defense playing without their leading tackler, linebacker Steve Tovar, out for the rest of the season with a knee reconstruction. Rookie Tom Tumulty stepped in for him last week and held his own at middle linebacker. Another rookie, Tim Morabito, is starting for Tim Johnson in the defensive line. Ashley Ambrose, tied for the league lead with eight interceptions, will be going to the Pro Bowl when they go to five defensive backs. It is Corey Sawyer who comes onto the field, number 23. Second down, 11 after the loss of a yard on first down by Eddie George. Man in motion is Willie Davis to give us to George, and once again, the Bengals rise up to meet the run. Hemo Van Olhoffen, number 67, in the middle of the defensive line with the stop. Well, we saw him involved not just in this play, but in the tackle before this. And again, we talked about the key to the game. Get the ball to Eddie George for the Houston Oilers and run the ball. Now, the Cincinnati Bengals felt that that also would be a key. Bruce Costell even said, he goes, hey, if they don't do that, if they don't let Eddie George at us, because of the uh, rookie middle linebacker, Tom Tumulty, because of Tim Morbido, the rookie defensive tackle, if they don't attack us up the middle, <laughs> they're not doing their job right because that's what the, I would be doing. So the Bengals trying to stop the running game, get it done on first and second down. Now Chandler will look to throw on third and 11. And the pass is complete to Sanders. And Sanders has first down yardage before he's brought down by Jimmy Spencer after a gain of 17. Good time. He had, uh, he had he had plenty of time in the pocket. Uh, they were closing in, but watch. It's just a simple route. Break it up. Pushing, uh, pushing number 22, Jimmy Spencer, just hard enough to get Spencer to turn his hips. You saw him start to turn his hips, thinking they were going to go deep. Brought it in for the, rece the reception. Mark of a well-coached team. Mm -hmm. Houston near the top of the league in terms of points scored on opening drives. You know, they get that. They come in with a game plan. It's not like these guys come in with a list of plays that they're going to run but they do have the game plan and try and stick to it. And now that they've established the pass with the throw to Sanders, it's a little bit looser for Eddie George as he comes to the line, stopped by Bo Orlando after a gain of about four. It'll be second down six. You know, that's one of the keys to this Houston team. Remember, this is a team that just a few years back was basically a run-and-shoot type of team. Tried to bring in a tight end and make some sort of hybrid type of thing that just was atrocious. Now they've gone to a basic conventional type of offense with a tight end. And uh, that balance between the run and the pass, they're finding out is very important. Jeff George, or Jeff Fisher, I should say, by his own admission, a defensive thinker, looking to Jerry Rome and Dick Curry to build the offense for him. On second down five, Chandler throws, complete to Ronnie Harmon. Harmon seemed to have the catch, but then is belted by number 22, Jimmy Spencer, and the ball comes loose. Yeah, well, you don't normally see that with Harmon. He is one of the most reliable backs out of the backfield as you call the third down back you're going to see him he is set just to the left of the screen he's just sneaking out he's the safety valve channel looking downfield decides hey, i'm going to dump this off and uh boy maybe you should have looked and saw that jimmy spencer was sitting there going i want to take a shot at ronnie Harmon." spencer one of the three free agent additions in the sensi defensive backfield having a tremendous year along with bo orlando and the aforementioned Ashley Ambrose headed to the Pro Bowl, having made eight interceptions this year. Now, third down five for the Oilers. They got Sanders 
on a deep slant for 17 yards on the first down on their previous third down situation. Play clock runs all the way down. Chandler under the blitz. Oh. And this is going to be called an incomplete pass, apparently, as Corey Sawyer was the man who came on the nickelback blitz, and Ricardo McDonald had a shot at the football. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, they, they came with the blitz. You're going to see down at the bottom of the side of your screen, 53 Tumulty, also 23 Corey Sawyer come in. He tries to kind of shovel that pass off, but doesn't get the ball up. Ricardo McDonald really gets almost gets the chance to grab the ball. Watch. He's just going to, he feels the pressure. He's just trying to, trying to shovel that ball off to the receiver out in front, but uh, who was number 20? Rodney Thomas. Reggie Roby comes on to kick it away, that exaggerated high leg kick motion. Roby lets it go all the way into the end zone over the head of David Dunn. 50-yard punt for Roby. Good for the average, not as good for field position as if he'd been able to angle it toward the sideline. We'll be back. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottler. Dr. Pepper is just what the doctor ordered. By Buick and your local dealers. Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. By Staples, the office superstore. And by IBM, season's greetings to a small planet from everyone at IBM. Well, there's a uh, high draft choice for the Oilers on the inactive list today because he looks like a bear. <laughs> and Jeff Blake brings on the Bengals offense, which has not done well on its opening drives, as you see ranking near the bottom of the league. But in recent weeks, this offense, as we told you, has been explosive. So Blake operates from the 20 and is immediately mashed by Robert Young, number 99, and number 78, Anthony Cook. Just great pressure on the outside. Normally, Jeff Blake's the kind of guy that when he feels the outside pressure can step up, but there's also a good push in the middle. He has nowhere to go. <laughs> Young left wide open. I mean, you can't make that sack. You're going to get yelled at and, and filmed big time. But he uh, very cautious, and the key there, Blake had nowhere to go, step up in the pocket for the sack. Rookie left tackle Willie Anderson looking inside and allowing Young to go by on the outside. So after the loss of eight, it's second down 18 with the football at the 12. This is Garrison Hurst, mainstay of the Bengal running game to the degree they have one. Anthony Cook makes the stop. It'll be third and ultra long coming up for the Bengals. Quickly, let's take a look at the Cincinnati offensive line. Two rookies have started. Willie Anderson and Ken Blackman coming on in the second half of the season, doing a lot better. They're satisfied with that department. Brian Milne, another rookie, has earned the starting job at fullback. Carl Pickens, a shoe-in for the Pro Bowl, having another tremendous year when they go to three wide. Eric Bieniemy is the third down back, and he's performed brilliantly. David Dunn, number 80, comes onto the field to make possession-retaining catches on third and fourth down. They need one here. Third down, 20. Plenty of time for Blake as the Oilers play coverage, and Blake lets it go down the sideline over the head of Darnay Scott. Now, now that's not a, a good sign. Darnay Scott, by the way, is not playing at 100%. He's been kind of... Uh, he's got a hip flexor. He's, he's got a hip flexor. For any people who don't know what it is, it's kind of... Well, it's in the hip. Actually, you know, he would have a hip flexor anyway, but what we really mean is he that he has an injured hip flexor. Hip flexor. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, he, he, uh, this is not this not bode well because he broke away from coverage, and Blake was not very accurate with that throw, and that was kind of what was happening to Blake early in the season. Mel Gray waits at his 40-yard line. Gray looked coltish and frisky on that opening kickoff return. See if he can bring the same energy to the chance to bring back a punt. But no, good coverage. High kick by Lee Johnson. Fair catch by Gray at the 40-yard line. Good field position for the Oilers when we come back. Colton. This is the NFL on NBC. Later today, we'll tell you about the terrific wager that took place this year between Jeff Fisher and the fabulous Bobby G. But first, we want to show you what a player Fisher was. This was one of his most memorable moments as a pro versus Tampa Bay 15 years ago. Returned this punt, 88 yards for a touchdown. He doesn't have that much speed now, but he could do pretty well back then, huh, Bob? Yeah, he sure could have, and the, the key was he ran past John McKay, his USC coach on the sidelines of Tampa Bay. Eddie George with his fourth carry of the game. Three carries for three yards on the first possession. Gracie Walker makes the stop here after a pickup of 11. And, Andy, boy, I tell you what, 
and look at him now. Obviously, we don't get a chance to, to check his speed. Not like we were going out and Fisher. racing with him. Jeff Fisher racing with him yesterday. But, uh, yeah, it, you know, that was the, that was kind of the funny thing. You saw him. He actually kind of looked over towards the sideline. And his, his college coach at USC, McKay, was, was the coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at the time. Well, his speed hasn't been the same since Bill Cower broke his leg. <laughs> Call it a gain of eight after uh, on George's first carry. Now he picks up three more and gets the first down. So I was premature in giving him credit for the first down, but he fulfills the expectation anyway. 1980 USC Trojans, as we give you another shot of Jeff Fisher along the sideline. Boy, this was the legendary oh, secondary. Oh, what, a, what a group. Look at these players. Joey Browner, the first actual Browner to escape the Notre Dame, uh, the Notre Dame University clutches. Dennis Smith, Denver Broncos stand up for so many years. Ronnie Lott, who I had an opportunity to play with. And, and of course, Jeff Fisher, who was the only one with a real job right now. And just to show you how long ago it was, Bruce Matthews was on that team at USC. A lot of people feel as though Matthews has spent his entire career in the NFL and never played college football. But in fact, he played for SC. Eddie George with the catch and another Houston first down into Cincinnati territory at the 33-yard line after a 15-yard gain. Gracie Walker and James Francis on the tackle. Well, they know the importance of this game. They've got to win these next two to have a chance. Just dump the ball up. It almost looked like George was his primary receiver. And I'll tell you what, whether he runs out of the backfield, he's got the size and the moves. But watch here. Makes a miss. Just a little acceleration. For a big guy like that to get that kind of quick and that kind of acceleration, he's a special running back. That's a part of his game that is still a work in progress. Eddie George as a receiver, but he showed you the ability and the instincts to do it there. Another first down for Houston. A little bit of a hole for George. Number 94 on his back, Javon Langford, the rookie defensive end out of Oklahoma State. Gain of three. It'll be second down seven from the 29. And you, and you know that the, the 152 yards rushing he had against the Bengals in the first game, they told us yesterday that that was a the, the draw play, which that play just was. They had 100 yards of that 152 were on draw plays alone. Including a 45-yard touchdown run. And you take a look at the rushing leaders for the season in the NFL. All of the four runners who are ahead of Eddie George are going to the Pro Bowl. He did not make it to the Pro Bowl for the AFC. We know there are Rookie of the Year honors that are coming up here soon. Chandler fires in and out of the hands of Sanders. The ball was right there for Tumblety to try to pick it off, but he didn't recognize quickly enough. Jimmy Spencer made the play from well, corner. You know, you know Sanders uh, kind of pushed Spencer off early in the game, got him to bite on a play for the completion. Since then, Spencer has really seems to have tightened down. We've watched, uh, look at him here, look at Spencer's quicks, look at the recognition, good timing of coming up making that play. This is one of the reasons that the Bengals have the opportunity to lead the league in interceptions as they do. Everybody wants to throw against them because they're a little bit leaky. Uh, you're exactly right. They are leaky, but uh, still like to get uh, a little bit more. They're getting the turnovers. But like I said, they'd rather, I think, sacrifice turnovers for less yardage. On third down seven, they go with the draw to Ronnie Harmon, and Harmon is met and dropped by James Francis as the Bengals read that play pretty quickly. Yeah, you know, when Harmon comes in, Everybody pretty much guesses about 95% of the time it's going to be him coming out of the backfield, the little dump pass. Uh, he doesn't get to carry the ball. All these third down backs, they, they don't want to just be third down backs. They all want to be able to carry the ball in the backfield. But after plays like that, you know why you send them out a little bit, little pass routes. Another terrific year for Al Del Greco, 29 of 34 with a long of 56 this year. Doesn't seem to be losing anything as the years go by. 13th year veteran out of Auburn. Nails this one from 46 yards out. And the Oilers take a first quarter lead over the Bengals with 6 minutes 33 seconds to go indoors before an intimate crowd in Houston. And the NFL on NBC will be back right after this. Bruce Coslett has led the Bengals to five wins in seven games since taking over at midseason for the deposed Dave Shula and today. Haslett agrees to terms with Mike Brown, Bengals president and general manager, on a new four-year contract. So that's the good news for Bengals fans as David Dunn takes the kickoff following an Al Del Greco field goal for the Oilers and Dunn. That's it back near the 30-yard line, 27-yard return, first flags of the game. First chance for us. Well, I was, I was about to introduce the referee, but that is not the referee. That is the place, the T uh, retriever. I don't think that's a, like... 
like the in the the whole dog like show the thing. Border collie to me. I, I don't think you call it a, a T retriever. Uh oh, no sound. Turn on your mic. Referee Ed Hochuli. Coslet so told you about the brand new four-year contract. Now you're saying this is a border collie? I think it's a border collie. Yep, Pure I think it's the uh, T-retrieving border collie. The T-retrieving border collie. I like it. Jeff Blake waiting for the opportunity to start the Bengal offense after the Oilers get on the board with a seven-play drive that goes 31 yards. Eddie George accounting for all 31 of the yards with three rushes for 15 and a catch for 16. So he sets up the Del Greco field goal, and it's free love Oilers. The give is to Hurst, and Garrison Hurst breaks through a good hole at the line of scrimmage, is met by the leading tackler for the Oilers, Pro Bowl strong safety Blaine Bishop, number well, 23. You know, there, there was a controversy early because John Carter paid so much money, wants to be the running back, they bring in Garrison Hurst, hey, he makes a ton of cash too. He has become the workhorse. He's been the productive running back, putting up a lot of yardage, you know, very few scores, but he has put up the yardage. Tough business decision coming up for Mike Brown and the Bengals. It would appear prohibitive under Caponomics to keep both running backs, mm -hmm. Carter and Hurst. And you give up a lot if you can't sign Hurst. Give us to Brian Milne, and Milne, the rookie fullback, pounds forward for a few yards. Blaine Bishop again makes the stop from strong safety. It'll be a first down at the 42-yard line for the Bengals. You know, as, as they try to establish a running back who can take control of this team, you see here, 63 games without a 100-yard rusher, and they're hoping Garrison Hurst can be that guy. But like you said, Jim, decisions to be made when this season's over. There's Kajana Carter standing on the sideline. Used quite a bit in goal line short yardage situations, but day-to-day -day operations with Garrison Hurst. On first down, Blake throws complete to David Dunn, and there's a rare reception for Dunn on a down other than third down. Marcus Robertson, the free safety, makes the stop for Houston. Well, you know, the, the first drive for the Bengals, they were pushed back against their own goal line. Here they've got a little bit of room. They're settling down, and Jeff Blake, like I said, here's the guy with the little uh, in-and-out route by number eight to David Dunn, and uh, Jeff Blake right on. Watch, you know, what's done here? He's going to start inside, plant, go back out, just get to, enough si si separation from the defenders to give him room to make the catch. Dunn, a big wide out at 6'3 and 210, loves to work the middle of the field. The give is to Kijana Carter, the fake fooled no one. The Oilers are there in big numbers, and rookie defensive Brian, tackle Brian Mix got there first. Henry Ford, who is normally starting a defensive tackle, injured, game time decision not to play. Bryant Mix, he comes in, and boy, good penetration. Houston front seven, and you can see Mix getting the start today in place of the injured tycoon Henry Ford. Joe Bowden, Baron Wortham, and Michael Bauer, a pretty solid linebacking core. These defensive backs think of themselves as a tremendous secondary, but they've combined for only 10 interceptions all year. Bishop going to the Pro Bowl largely on the strength of his great run support. Third down five for the Bengals, bunched tightly at the line of scrimmage. Flag goes down, and Carter gets no chance to turn to look for the ball. Here's referee Ed Hochuli again. Before the ball was snapped, ball start by the offense, number 61. Five-yard penalty remains third down. Penalty on tackle Melvin Tootin. Well, Melvin Tootin, number 61, backs up Joe Walter, the, the, the one veteran. You're going to see 61 right there. You're going to see him move a little bit early. There, just kind of rocks back in a stance a little bit. Sometimes they try and cheat eh, just a tad because they know that the speed of the outside rushers, they've got to try to anticipate. You see Joe Walter, the starting right tackle on the sideline. He's been injured, and they weren't sure today how much playing time he'd get. So Tootin in the lineup for the moment, replacing Walter. It's third down 10 now with Dunn in motion. Blitz, oh. almost a pickoff. Would have been a touchdown for fifth defensive back Raphael Robinson if he'd been able to hold on. And, you know, <laughs> the Bengals came out with almost the same play. Good play defensively by the Oilers. And the anticipation, Raphael Robinson, watch him. He's right there. He's going he's gonna to just make the jump. He reads the eyes of the quarterback of Jeff Blake and he makes the break in the ball. There's Raphael just kind of sitting back. See, the problem was none of the receivers had gone deep enough to force Raphael Robinson deep. So he just kind of was able to sit back in that zone, anticipate the, the throw, and look at the eyes of the quarterback. 
Lee Johnson's punt is a little bit short. It'll be allowed to drop. Bounces inside the 30-yard line. Rolls out of bounds at about the 28. 30-yard punt. A short one for Lee Raphael Robinson lamenting the missed touchdown chance. As we bring you back to Houston, we remind you, experience the NFL all week long on NFL.com, the official website of the National Football League. For all the tackles and touchdowns and a live game day scoreboard, click on NFL.com as insatiable Internet Explorer Bob Golick has done right here. And the good thing about this website, Bob. Hey, I brought the laptop. We got, we got actual scores going on right now as we speak. We can kind of figure out all the teams that are involved in the combinations of possible playoff combinations, and we can uh, send notes down to the coaches if we want and to. And it'll keep you away from those sewing and cooking websites at least for a little <laughs> while. Sanders with a 29-yard catch, and you see here why Chris Sanders averages 19.4 yards per grab. Yeah, he's going to be on the left side of the screen just tearing it down the sideline. Sanders, not only is he a possession type of guy, but very good at getting the separation from the receiver. You saw there working up against Spencer. And All look the way at the, the 47-yard line to pick up the 29. It'll be first and 10 for the Oilers from there. And you see Sanders listed among the big play receivers. Henry Ellard leading the league in yards per catch. At his year. age. He's awesome. Eddie George cuts to the outside, <laughs> finds his own running room. Boy. And has good yardage before the Bengals can stop him. Let's step in to New York and check with the run stopper, Greg Gumbel. <laughs> All right, Jim, we'll take you to Kansas City. After a two-week absence, Jim Harbaugh is back. This is a three-yard touchdown toss to Marvin Harrison. The ball crosses the goal line. The Chiefs need a win to clinch a playoff spot, but right now, late in the first quarter, the Colts lead Kansas City 7-0, Jim. All right, thank you very much, Greg. You know, Bob, I heard a rumor that Greg was spending so much time on the Internet that he got rid of his personal computer. Did he really? Yeah, to change his life. No, hey, That's a, uh, a little-known fact about Greg I, Gumbel that I all know his fan it. club members will want to jot down. Eddie George oh, bursts through the line and is dragged down from behind by Bracey Walker, who made what might have been a touchdown-saving tackle because there was a seam there. There was a seam there, and when you give Eddie George a seam, I mean, did you see the explosiveness? Did you see the way he just, he found that hole? Watch, he's going to come to the line. He's just going to kind of, just kind of wait, just pause a little bit. He's right there. He's just pausing, waiting for the blocks to develop. Boom, cut, explode. And right there working up against Bracey Walker, he's got the strength to break those tackles, so you got to give it to Bracey Walker on that one. Look at that, just found a nice hole. And he, like I said, for a big guy to have that kind of acceleration, to be able to, uh, to find those holes, great job. This time a gain of only a couple. Met by Ricardo McDonald as he reached the line of scrimmage. That came on first down. It'll be second down eight now with the football at the 35. And there's an official's timeout as an Oilers player is down. Jeff Fisher, a player's coach all the way, mm -hmm. immediately strides onto the field to talk with Roderick Lewis. Well, you know, this is a team that, 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 that they, they need to get something going. Not only do they need a couple of wins to get into the playoffs, but they've also got to start building here. They've got to start finding some uh, some confidence back. You know, we talked about some of the situations they went through, the Seattle game where they lose on the blocked field goal. The, the Miami inter game. Th with the interception by Zach Thomas, things like that. Uh, you know, we talked to Bruce Matthews yesterday. He said, you know, when you've been down as long as we have, it's hard to get rid of that negative mentality. So when those things start to happen again, all of a sudden there's a lot of guys starting to get back that, oh, here we go again type of mentality. And I'll tell you what, losing can be very infectious. Well, and you wonder what this team would be like with a home following. Obviously, they are in an agonizing yeah. lame duck situation here in Houston. Maybe looking at yet another year mm -hmm. of agonizing lame duck status next year. They've lost their last four at home. And this is the kind of team which has enough talent that you are led to believe with crowd support. Bud Adams' group might have been winning games. Right. What if they were in Nashville with a wildly enthusiastic crowd? Of course, they don't have the stadium yet. Ha having been, a, yeah, exactly. They'd be playing in, you know, in some pickup lot. But, uh, you know, having been a player, I, you want to be, I, I believe, I totally believe that the emotion of the game, a lot of it, uh, revolves around being able to to feel like you're 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 loved or you're wanted like there's this family this this tight tie this uh, between the the players the team the community and here it's almost antagonistic although as you know as I try to tell the fans hey you know it wasn't the players decision to, to move wasn't the coaches decisions for you know they've all got houses and families they would love to just be able to, to keep here uh, but it, it's not going to happen doesn't mean you can't still support these players 
hard for the community to warm up for them. They play for the man who probably now ranks as Houston's most hated citizen, Adams. Rodney Thomas is in the game now on second down eight with the football at the 35. Thomas moves slightly offset to the left as Chandler appears to be audibling. audibling. Bengals show blitz and bring it. Oilers pick it up, and Chandler alertly gets oh. the ball in the flat to Derek Russell, who breaks the tackle and gets five extra yards against Corey Sawyer. Eight to ten. Derek Russell, they bring in from Denver, and uh, boy, nice job of, of knowing where he was. Gets it at about the eight, you know, at about eight yards downfield, and a good move, good strength. They're trying to just pick up the extra yards to get the first down. But you're going to see here, he just makes the catch. Good defense. Corey Sawyer right on him. Russell just able to uh, to pull out of that tackle, pick up the first down. And the first quarter comes to a close with the Bengals trailing 3-0 to the Oilers and the Oilers off that good play from Chandler to Russell looking for more. We'll be back in the NFL on NBC after this. The Oilers have had a tough streak recently losing four of their last five but people around the league still believe that Jeff Fisher's doing a great job of coaching and the Oilers mm -hmm. still have a plausible playoff shot. You're Bob. exactly right. They win the last two games and two out of these three last. Indianapolis who right now is beating Kansas City. Oakland has to one, Oakland has to lose. They're losing right now. The last update I had was Denver seven, Oakland three and also you saw the rest of it. Plus they had another opportunity. San Diego lost yesterday which made the job even better. And Eddie George busts down to the 19-yard line. We check in with Greg Gumbel in New York. Greg. Jim, last time we talked, it was Harbaugh to Marvin Harrison. Darn if they haven't done it again. This one for 37 yards. Does Harbaugh have enough time to find his man? The Colts have grabbed the two-touchdown lead now on Kansas City. 18 seconds to play in the first quarter, Jim. Thank you very much. No comment from Greg on the uh, report that he had given away his personal computer, and we'll continue to check that out as the season goes on <laughs> here on NBC. Second down four from the 19 after the six-yard pickup by George. And the rookie George. tailback pounds forward for another couple of yards. Ricardo McDonald making the stop as the Oilers try to play it safe with this scoring chance. You know, you're exactly right, but they're still going to go with Eddie George. And when you're going to give the ball to the guy 25 times, he's not going to bust them all. There's going to be some ones where he's going to, he's just going to have to stick his head up into a hole or into an area where maybe there should be a hole. You see Bracey Walker right there to make a nice play. I'm starting to really like Bracey Walker against the running game, and you look at how Eddie George's rookie year has compared to the rookie year of some of the other successful Heisman Trophy running backs. Earl Campbell, incidentally, and of course, did that with the Oilers. And some of those guys actually were rookies of the year also. Yeah, yeah I think George Rogers was. But this time, Earl George Campbell. is stopped short of the first down. It's going to be fourth down one at the 16 and a fourth down decision now yeah, for... This is an Jim, easy one, huh? This is an easy one. You, you yeah. go for the points right now. You've proven so far that you have the ability to move the ball. You, you, they're moving it up and down the field. They're going to get other opportunities. They're going to be within a scoring position again because of what they've been able to do. So go for the points now and take the lead. I'm going to bet you that Reggie Roby, number seven, the punter, at 6'3 and 258 pounds, is the biggest holder in the league. Del Greco's kick. That was that was blocked. Wide right. A rare miss from 26 yards for Al Del Greco, and the Oilers squander a scoring chance, still lead three love. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Acura, who invites you to test drive the new CL Luxury Sports Coupe. By AT&T, your true choice. And by Compact. Has it changed your life yet? The building receding behind those fountains, the famous medical center, which has given Houston much of its identity, had disgusted Al Del Greco, one of the three best golfers in the NFL, <laughs> laments the field goal equivalent of a missed five-foot putt. We told you, Bob, that yeah. Houston wanted to control the football, and they've done it. And they've done that, uh, although right now they still only sit with a three-point lead, but they have proven, as I said before, that they can move the ball. And also, as you're seeing here on this play, defensively, they're having some pretty good success so far against the Bengalo. Garrison Hurst's attempt, blunted by Gary Walker. I think I should have said the field goal equivalent of a missed two-foot putt. Blake 
has not yet found a way to bring an explosion out of the Bengals offense. Well, you know, right now they, they've got to do something to, to spur some interest. Jeff Blake has to take control of this game himself as a quarterback. Start making some plays. Ball control passing and then uh, lay a couple up. Get it out to pick us. He can make the big play that can spark a team. Blake, the AFC oh. Offensive Player of the Week, goes down in the grasp of Robert Young. And for the second time, Young manhandled the Cincinnati's offensive line. Young and, offensive line. And, and all he did was a straight rush upfield, just kind of ripped upfield. I, I think he's working up against the rookie, Willie Anderson. He just tore it upfield. Watch it here. You're going to see right there, there's Willie Anderson, the tackle just straight upfield. Willie just didn't take it deep enough. Either that or, or Blake had set a little bit too deep. One way or another, the communication was there. Young right in to make the sack. Beautiful clean sack. Third down, 20 with the football at the 14-yard line, and given the field position consideration, the Bengals may have to play a little bit cozy here. Maximum protection for Blake. He picks out a receiver and goes to Dunn, his favorite target in possession situations, Joe Bowden. Escorts done out of bounds, well short of the first down. And, and there's a little pushing and shoving going on, but Jim, do you think they're a little concerned about the protection back there? Right after Willie Anderson allows the sack, next play, a little short, little sprint out just to get Jeff Blake out of the pocket, keep him out of uh, the direct view of those prying eyes of the defensive lineman. And it was a short sprint out with the fullback Milne and the running back Hurst both staying in. Lee Johnson, two punts with a long of 50 so far. The last one was not one of his better efforts. Mel Gray waits just at his 30-yard line. And Johnson sends this one on a roll to Gray at the 30. It gets to about the 36. So Houston will once again have reasonably favorable field position after the 45-yard punt by Johnson, the six-yard return by Gray. Chandler and company coming onto the field again. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Domino's Pizza. Call now to enjoy a hot and delicious Domino's Pizza by halftime. For hot and wow, call Domino's now. What are you doing next Saturday, Bob? I'm going to watch some football. Jim. Fabulous. We've got it for you next Saturday. NBC Sports presents more exciting NFL action at the special time of 12 noon Eastern with the NFL on NBC. Then... Watch Drew oh. Bledsoe and the New England Patriots head to the Meadowlands to meet Dave Brown and the New York Giants. Actually, you'll watch them in the Meadowlands after they've already gotten there. Yes. It's a special Saturday edition of the NFL on NBC next Saturday starting at 12 noon Eastern. Yeah, Probably wouldn't be all that interesting to watch them head to the Meadowlands. You know, <laughs> little bus ride down the interstate. So what? It's a documentary. I'd rather see a football game. Patriots lose to Dallas today and also Giants lose 17-3 to New Orleans. First down from the 36-yard line. It's not really good for the promo, Bob, to point out all those recent losses. Yeah, but I'm, I'm also I'm reading it up off of the NFL.com. Oh, I understand. You're an honest man. <laughs> Derek Russell on the catch from Chandler. Jimmy Spencer made the stop. Short gain. It'll be second down six with the football at the 40, and you can see that Houston has monopolized the ball so far. Well, when you talk time of possession, you're also talking first downs, being able to move the ball down the field. The Bengals haven't been able to do that yet. Steve McNair, you see on the sidelines, has had been the starting quarterback till they decided to go back with Chris Chandler. More and more NFL teams going to the interchangeable quarterback format. You don't know from week to week who might be starting. Chandler's not terribly happy about that. Pump fake, throw deep, over the head of Russell. Or check it, Willie Davis. Yeah. Jimmy Spencer again there on the coverage for the Bengals. You know, talking to... They haven't thrown at Ambrose, incidentally. No, well, why not? <laughs> yeah, why should you? Ambrose got all those interceptions. Did you see Chris Chandler just with the overthrow, pump fake short, th overthrows it? But talking to Chris Chandler uh, yesterday, you know, he was, uh, last week, he was coming off the uh, the ankle injury. As you see, the ball just a little bit, a little bit long. He said he could have played. They could have shot up the ankle. He could have played. Uh, but uh, uh, Jeff Fisher's whole concept was that... that uh, uh, McNair was not good coming off the bench. So let's start with McNair. If it doesn't work out, then we can put Chandler in, and that would be a better scenario. Third and six from the 40, 10, 19 to go in the half. Chandler fires to Derek Russell. Russell using his body to seal off Spencer, makes the big catch for 16 yards. Another Houston first down, another chance for them to eat the clock and keep it away from Zinn. Exactly. Once again, here's Derek Russell. There to Chandler spreading the ball around nicely to his wide receivers. Derek Russell making a couple of nice snags today. This just a simple 
down and in, brings it inside, and look at here, third down passing. Great, great numbers. Percentage completion, eh, 50% is okay, but look at the touchdowns to interception ratio and quarterback rating, 108.4. Not bad numbers. Good work by Chandler. Good play calls by Jerry Rome, the offensive coordinator. Another good stop by Kimo Van Ulhofen against the Houston running game. Well, you know, when, when, the, when the running game has stopped, uh, uh, the Oilers running game has been stopped. Kimo von Alhoffen has been involved up in the line, and also Bracey Walker has come up from the secondary. There's They've Jerry Rome. There's Jerry Rome. We've got to get more people. The Bengals have to get more people involved in that run game because uh, they don't, man. There's Kimo. You see Kimo von Alhoffen. Who they played his football at Boise State in college, and coincidentally, Rome's beard would work well in Boise. <laughs> Second down 13 from the 47-yard line. 9-0-1 still to go in the first half. Oilers have had opportunities, but only three points. Still, they're keeping the football away from Cincinnati with a methodical offensive approach. Tumulty makes the stop on Eddie George after George makes another catch. And, and, and again, Chandler's got all kinds of time. He's got all the time in the world. Look at the protection here with Chris Chandler. You know, when the run game's going this well, wow, look at this right here. I mean, Chandler, is just he's got this huge pocket. No, no, nobody near him can throw the ball off, dumps it off to George for a short game. Viewers in Cincinnati getting a good chance to see your telestrator skills. <laughs> so desperately missing from last week's broadcast against the Ravens. It's third broke. down and 11. I didn't break it last week. Oh, I think it was the cold. It just broke. The snow. Chandler with good protection on third down. Looks on the comebacker to Chris Sanders. Good route by Sanders, but he came past the chain and is going to be about a yard short of a first down. First time they've gone at Ambrose. Yeah, if they have, they're working against Andros. But you got to wonder here. I mean, we've talked about Chris. We've talked about uh, Chris Chandler, and uh, you know, I don't know. As a receiver, he's out there far enough. He's out there past the chain. He knows where he had to go. Chris Chandler, that kind of missed through that ball a little bit, a little bit short. Give it to Sanders. He knew where the marker was. He knew where the first down had to be. Chandler threw it a little short, and that's why they're in fourth and one. Fourth down and a short two. It's really about a yard and a half. And they line up with no setback. Four wide receivers on the field. Harmon slips into a seam. He fires instead to Eddie George. And Eddie George, emerging as a receiver today, <laughs> makes this catch for 14 and, yards. And you're right. This hasn't been his forte. He's just trying to learn, you know, kind of learn a little bit about how to be a receiver. Watch the slant coming from the left side. He is just coming straight across here. Just not enough time for 53 Tom Tumulty to react up. You know, they've they've got to hold their zones but that ball came so quick nobody could react to it and that was just all eddie george after he got the ball i think among all the exceptionally high draft choices in the first round he's one of two truly great offensive players to have come into the league this year the other one being jonathan ogden with the ravens on first down chandler's throw is a little high intended for willie davis who does eddie george remind you of to me he's like a bigger stronger marcus allen yeah, uh, yeah a, a little bit definitely stronger I haven't seen a guy that has the combination of the quicks and the strength and the moves the, the acceleration because I mean I love the way because normally with with the bigger stronger backs you can't see them pussyfoot around in the backfield and then explode for the hole this guy certainly has does it has done it but he doesn't overuse that acceleration he has the knack for staying behind blockers and using them to the max mm -hmm. ninth play of the drive Oilers trying to build on a three nothing lead and the Bengals are begging for the football at this stage. Chandler looks in the end zone. Good coverage by Ambrose, working against Sanders. No chance to complete that pass. All incidental contact out there. Ambrose in, in good position, although he did get his feet tangled up. Good job, though. Watch, top of the screen. You can see the, the, two, the two guys matched up right there. They're going to work it down the field. Ambrose basically taking away the route he kind of he used the sidelines kind of worked him into the sidelines like i said they got their feet tangled but when they did that he took out all the speed out of the route and the overthrow was uh, came from chandler so it's third down 10 football at the 23 yard line and the oilers paying the price now for having elected to throw on first and second down and having completed neither play cockley's clock is going to run out and this will be a delay of game call against the oilers well that's what you need on third and 10 not particularly. Not particularly. Uh, once again, I mean, the, 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 the Oilers are doing a good job of controlling the clock, 
spending more time, you know, using up all the time of possession, getting the first downs, moving it down the field, but they get down here to the red zone and just not having success. And you're right. That beard is looking good. That would be good in Boise, wouldn't it? In fact, I think Kima Van Olhoffen should take him up there. Houston, one of the least penalized teams in the league. Another mark of, of a good coaching, of good coaching. You're yeah. exactly right. Jeff Fisher. Tenth player of the drive for the Oilers. Rodney Thomas on the field as the setback. And they go with Thomas on the draw play. And don't fool too many Bengals. As that one will lead to another Al Del Greco field goal try. I think I heard a couple of boos. And I'll tell you what, I, I think Rome is chewing something other than tobacco, and that would play well in Boise also. Why is that? Well, because it's, you know, it's a rustic kind of uh, mountaineer place. It, it, there's a sense of independence. It's dangerous to chew something other than gum. We'll get to it later. <laughs> Del Greco from 42 yards out of Reggie Roby's hold. Bruce Matthews, the pro bowler snaps the football and that one is drilled down the middle so he misses from 26 but he makes it from 43 the Bengals are still wondering if they'll get a chance to try to sustain a possession before the first half comes to a close six nothing for Jeff Fisher's Oilers well you talk about the Houston Oilers they have been dominating because of this man Eddie George getting his ankle tightened up a little bit on the sidelines no indication that it was a serious injury, but sometimes the backs just like to have a little bit more support. David Dunn takes the kickoff and returns it back across the 30 to about the 32. John Henry Mills, Pro Bowl special teams player, made the tackle. Tonight on Dateline, your holiday shopping and you were overcharged. Find out how Dateline's hidden cameras caught them in the act again and again. We made one of your favorite stores change its ways. An undercover investigation. Watch Dateline tonight on NBC. This man checking out holiday shopping prices at and this opportune time in his life. And with the uh, the lack of, of people in the dome, here we have Tom. We're able to name all the uh, people who come to the games here. <laughs> they have to we'll identify most of the rest of the fans <laughs> for you as the game goes on. Plenty of good seats still available here with 543 to go before halftime in Houston. On first down, Jeff Blake gets him into a second and ten as he overthrows Troy Sadowski. Let's go to Greg Gumbel, who's shopping in New York. All right, Jim, and back to Kansas City we go, where Rich Gannon unleashes the screen to Kimball Anders, who goes 18 yards for the touchdown. Gannon has been injured. He's been replaced by Steve Bono. But the Chiefs, Jim, take a megabyte out of that Colt lead. It's now 14-7, second quarter. All right, Greg, and if you want to get Greg Gumbel a Christmas present, please do buy him a brand new personal computer to replace the one that he got rid of to get himself off the Internet. On second down, Blake again uh. under a heavy rush, third sack of the day for the Oilers, and the Oilers' pass rush is manhandling the Cincinnati offensive line. Michael Barrow and Anthony Cook were there. Michael Barrow blitz on the outside, forced... Jeff Blake, you can see Barrow down at the bottom. He's right there. He is coming upfield. He forces Blake to step up, and when he steps up, Anthony Cook's right there to finish him off. You know, and, you know, the one thing about Blake is because of his mobility, he does have the ability to move around the pocket if you leave him some room up in front of him. But they're not giving him any. They're getting outside rush, good outside rush, and also good push up the middle so he has nowhere to go. Good scheme by the Oilers. This time they bring the blitz. Blake reads it, gets the football to Kijana Carter, and Carter makes a big play out across the 40-yard line. Marcus Robertson and Chris Dishman make the stop. It's a 15-yard pickup. Not enough to move the chain and get him a first down. Once again, watch here. They just get burned on the outside. Barrel once again with a shot on Blake. And uh, Kajana Carter, who has been used, in, it's not sparingly, but in certain situations, good out of the backfield. Here's the hit on Blake. Michael Barrow coming up on the outside with a uh, with a blitz, getting a good shot, and Jeff Blake was slow getting up after that play. And after that hit on Blake, there was also a Marcus Robertson shot against Kijana Carter that was pretty physical, and Chris Dishman is shaken up slightly here. Dishman, the veteran cornerback out of Purdue, who suggested to us in meetings that he might want to bring an end to his long tour of duty in Houston. 
Yeah, he wasn't real thrilled after uh, last week's game. He made some uh, some pretty strong comments, and in fact, that they were they were so strong that it actually upset a lot of the players. One of the players, which is surprising, you don't normally see it from a young guy, a rookie, but Eddie George, I guess, confronted him about some of the things, and and this was this was one one of the things that Chris Dishman said. If God tapped me on the shoulder, told me I had to play for another season with the Oilers, I'd retire. And he told us when he says change, he's talking about either another team or retirement, but he does not want to come back to this Oilers team. And you can almost hear what Eddie George said to him. Hey, we've still got a shot at a playoff berth. We're a pretty good football team, and you're supposed to be a leader here. Lee Johnson pounds this punt down to about the 10-yard line. A brave catch by Mel Gray, and Gray eludes tacklers out to the 22. Greg Truitt, the snapper, made the return after it, or made the tackle after a 10-yard return, and we'll be back. A look at Bruce Coslett, five wins in seven games in his new tour of duty as head coach of the Bengals, and here's their chance to make the playoffs, Bob. It's not good, but they have to win their final two games. If they do that, other things have to happen. The Colts have to lose to the Chiefs today. That ain't happening. The Dolphins have to lose one of their last two games. If the Oilers lead the Bengals in that point within the AFC Central, the Oilers must lose the Dolphins next week. The Chargers must lose the final game, and one of the problems is her. The Jaguars have to tie today and lose next week. The Raiders have to lose today and tie next week. They got a good chance, don't they? Jupiter has to align with Mars, you alluded to it. On first down, Chandler's pass intended for Frank Wycheck is incomplete. Wycheck, leading receiver this year for the Oilers yeah. with 45 catches. Uh, the exa he, is, he has been a staple. They brought him in, and there you see Bruce Coslett on the sidelines with his new, uh, well, which would be signed this week, the new contract, as we Four year contract. Earlier. If they make the playoffs in the third or, or the fourth, fourth year, year a will fifth get a year is then added to the contract. I guess at that point, they're assuming by the third or fourth year with free agency, he'll have put together his team. And if he's successful with his team, then they'll give him that fifth year. Well, I don't know. He has to deal with Mike Brown to get his team. And yeah. That has always been a question mark for coaches in Cincy. Chandler throws deep, intended for Sanders, and Sanders couldn't quite get back to the middle of the field, and the flag goes down on Jimmy Spencer. I don't know. I mean, Jimmy Spencer had him pretty much worked against the sideline. They're calling the... They're calling them all down. It looked like Sanders had a hold of Jimmy Spencer, though. And now the Bengals are signaling exactly that. They're saying it's going to be a game. Yeah. Oh! Oh, man. You know, looking at that one, uh, Sanders... Watch Sanders. Sanders. Interference by the defense, number 22, cut off. What do you think? Automatic first down. Watch him right here. He, he didn't... I mean, he's got some lean. Everybody does that. Everybody does the touching. There you have the hold. You have the hold of uh, Sanders on Spencer's sleeve. I don't know. I mean, that... that They're going either way. Look, yeah, you can see Coslett back there getting ready to yell for the offensive interference against Sanders. I mean, he wasn't pushing off. He had the lean going, but everybody has the lean going. You use the you use that lean against the sidelines. You just kind of like take away their free run to the ball. Bruce Coslett is a heck of a nice guy, but uh, he can blister you Boy. when he gets his temper up, huh? <laughs> we had him in a meeting last Whoa. week who about <laughs> blistered us. <laughs> Talk about explosive. On first down, Eddie George sneaks forward for a lot of yardage again. Terrific performance today by Eddie George. And another terrific performance by Greg Gumbel in our studio. Why, thank you, James. That's Denver. John Elway turning in a pretty good performance of his own. This is the second touchdown pass of the day. A 20-yarder to Rod Smith, who does most of the work to get to the end zone. 21-3. Denver now in the lead over Oakland. Incidentally, Jim, my online name is Take 5. <laughs> it is what? I knew that was going to leak out somehow. <laughs> <laughs> what is his online name? Oh, we'll get it. We're going we're gonna to mat it in a graphic here pretty shortly. <laughs> Eddie George sneaks up the middle again on second down and three. After the gain of seven on first down, he gets four yards here. Goes to the 27. Clock running, 3.20 to go in the half. And the Oilers are sticking to their effective game plan of running the clock and keeping the ball. You know, you see Bruce Matthews, you see this offensive line. I mean, this is one of the reasons this, this team does so well. You know, we put it on, we keep talking about Eddie George and how well he's doing. Well, the reality is that offensive line is just, has always been very, very good. Look at Bruce Matthews. In the year, uh, and, and the, these years, these guys play such specific positions. You see all the different positions that Bruce has played. Anywhere across that offensive line, they can put him and he can be just as effective. Well, uh, when you talk about Bruce Matthews, and I say this as complimentarily as is humanly possible, he's just a freak of nature. He's not yeah. like any other guy his age. 
other than his brother, Clay Matthews, Clay, who's who never we, played in the league. And we talked about yesterday to him about Clay. He goes, I, th he goes, I think Clay's still going to keep coming back, and Clay's like 90 right now. <laughs> and, and like I said, you know, there are guys out there who can't move from right tackle to left tackle because of footwork, because of stance and all this. And you've got Bruce Matthews, who has gone anywhere from center to every other position on the line and has done everything. Couldn't make the Pro Bowl at just about any of those positions. Nine-time Pro Bowler Bruce Matthews playing left guard next to Pro Bowl center Mark Stepnoski. And Harmon takes a look at that hold and bounces to the outside and fights his way for a gain of about four or five. It'll be third down coming up as the two-minute warning arrives. Bob, I want to warn you, there are only two minutes left before halftime. Thanks. Oilers rookie running back sensations, Eddie George, the inheritor this year to the tradition established by the great Earl Campbell in 1978. Eddie having almost as good a year as Earl had when he stepped into the Oiler uniform. They've met, they've spent time together, and Earl says he's like a chip off the old block. But Earl's thighs are much bigger oh, than anyone. They've hit me right in the face a couple of <laughs> than times. Than your thighs, and that's saying something. <laughs> the throw is to Malcolm Floyd on third down seven from the 23. Bo Orlando makes the stop. Clock continues to run inside two minutes and looks to me like they'll be about a half yard short of a first down. And, and so once again, they, they sit themselves in a situation where they've worked it all the way down the field. You got the fans yelling, go for it, come on. It looks like they're gonna stay on, stay on, keep the offense going, and try and get seven before halftime. Clock is being allowed to run. Because really, Jim, right now, you're, you're talking about an, uh, an Oiler team that has dominated offensively. They've, they've dominated, they've got first downs, they've moved up and down the field, but the reality is they're only up by six points. So the Oilers elect to use the timeout and stop the clock now to consider their options at fourth and one. From the 17, we'll be right back. Jeff Fisher and staff, having made up their minds what to do on fourth and one at the 17, a minute 27 to go in the half, 6 0 yeah. Houston. Well, they, Al Del Greco still on the sideline. You know, Jim, they, they got to go for the touchdown, though. Like I said, with all the stats, with all the time of possession, with all the yardage and first downs, they're only up by six. They got to try and get at least a touchdown to give them a little more cushion. Eddie George in the game as the setback behind Chandler. Sanders in motion. Since he defense playing the run, but nevertheless, the Oilers are able to mash forward for first down yardage as George elected to go behind the right guard, Kevin Donnelly, number 77, and Donnelly got the, the uh, purchase for him. He, he sure did. You know, short yardage situation, defenses are asked to come in low. They want him to attack low, undercut the offensive linemen so they can't get any kind of a push but up against a running back that has the power to, to take on a shot like that and get the extra yardage, there's no way you're going to stop him there unless somebody comes strong and takes a chance and gets lucky. If you're Cincy, you might be guessing that they would go behind Stepnoski and Matthews, the two pro bowlers. Instead, they go behind Donnelly and Eatman and get the first down. So after the fourth down conversion, the throw is to Harmon, and Harmon's knocked out of bounds at the five-yard line by Bracey Walker. Good tackle by Walker, but Harmon slips under the coverage again. Locked up man-to-man -man against Bracey Walker, and, and Harmon, we've talked about so many times, as a guy out of the back, you see him where he just out of the right side of your screen, just got the jump. He was, uh, again, you know, as a defender, Bracey Walker has to be very aware of what happens in man-to-man -man coverage against his man, this time being Ronnie Harmon. So with Ronnie Harmon getting that kind of running start, he, you knew he always was going to be one step ahead of Bracey Walker. Gracie Walker and his strong play, the reason why last week's game-saving hero Sam Shade doesn't get a lot of playing time. Shade's game-saving tackle on Carwell Gardner last week, only his third solo stop of the season for the Bengals. That's pretty good after the game. <laughs> Coslett said he makes one tackle in the game and he's got 25 reporters around him. Such is life. 43 seconds still to go. They earn a first down at the five-yard line. Now Chandler under pressure, fumbles the football, and the Bengals will stop this scoring threat. James Francis came with the blitz. And number 55, Andre Collins, knocked the football loose. Javon Lankford, number 94, made the recovery. Nice rush from, the, from, from coming up. You're going to see in the replay here from the right-hand side. Here comes the rush, here comes Francis. And watch as he tackles, he's going to swipe at the ball with his arm. Good job. I mean, the coaches teach that. You can't always focus like that. But he had a clean shot on Chandler. You're going to get another look here. Watch as Chandler goes to run, he's going to swat right at the ball. He sees it, 
knocked that ball loose. Did Tremendous exactly what he's trying to do. Yep, great play by James Francis. Very good awareness Former because... first round draft choice out of Baylor. At this point, what else do you do besides try and force a turnover? So that will leave the Bengals within a touchdown of the Oilers after a first half in which the Oilers have held the ball, controlled the clock, kept it away from the Bengals' offense, accomplished most of their objectives except for putting points on the board. Kijana Carter trying to break a big one before halftime, and Carter has a gain of about seven before Raphael Robinson and Chris Dishman make the stop. Coming up, it's the Domino's Pizza NFL on NBC Halftime Report. Greg Gumbel, Mike Ditka, Joe Gibbs, Chris Collinsworth bringing you all the scores and news from around the league. Interesting first half, Bob. You know, absolutely not the way you would expect it to happen. Not the way that the Cincinnati Bengals, as prolific, we showed the graphics early before at the beginning of the game, how good, how many yardage they put up in the last three games, how many points they've scored, averaging in the last three games, just not showing it today. Bengals making just enough big plays on defense to stay within shouting distance of the Oilers at 6-0 Houston. Let's take you directly to Gren Gubble at our NFL on NBC studio in New York. Back in Houston, where Bruce Coslett has just agreed to a new four-year contract with the Cincinnati Bengals, his offense took most of the first half off against the Oilers. Jim Lampley again, along with the fabulous Bobby D. Bob Golick. A funny thing happened to us on the way to the Dallas Cowboys New England Patriots game. We decided to detour here instead to do the <laughs> Bengals and the Oilers. And Bob, as we look at the Coors Light halftime stats, there's no real key stat to pick out. They all tell the same story. Well, I'll tell you the key stat. The key stat is this entire row right here. Cincinnati Bengals have done nothing. One first down in an entire half is unbelievable. And also, you talk about Jeff Blake, the prolific passer, five yards of passing. This is just not, you've got, you know, we, we talked about Blake, we talked about Pickens, we talked about Darnay Scott, we talked about all the, the explosiveness that they have, and they have five-yard pass. Interesting uh, to note that the Oiler defense appears to have been designed today to take away the passing game. Let's see if the Bengals are going to try to run the ball to start the game. They, they, uh, have, to, they're, they're, well, they they're gonna have to try something, because like I said, Chris Chandler coming back off the injury, replacing Steve McNair, who had been starting in for him, having a pretty good day. But like I said, and, uh, Jeff Blake, this is nowhere near the type of day that you're expecting, especially when we talked about early in the game, or excuse me, right before the game, they had the last three games been putting up a ton of points, like 340 yards of offense. This is just not Bengal offense. The Bengals will get a chance to the ball to start the second half. David Dunn taking Al Del Greco's kickoff and running it back 21 yards across the 25-yard line. Steve Jackson downfield to make the stop for the Oilers along with special team pro bowler John Henry Mills, number 55. And Blake comes on looking for a better tour of duty than this series of first-half possessions. Oh, man. This is, uh, hey, the only thing to stop us from punting anymore was halftime. And you see there, four plays, four plays, four plays. They did have that one six-play drive, but it was, uh, you know, it was the one that got them the one first down. Well, here's the great news. After getting wiped out in the first half like that, statistically, they're only down 6 nothing on the scoreboard because the Oilers missed so many opportunities. And they do start off running the ball in the second half. Garrison Hurst has a good game. Gary Walker makes the stop, and this is the right strategy. Make the Oilers prove they can stop the run. Be because Garrison Hurst running in the first half was just kind of sporadic. It seemed like they wanted to attack him in the passing game. Now they've got to come up. They've got to put some fear, at least some thought, in the Houston Oilers defense that they can run against them. Once they do that, then you're going to bring your coverage people. are going to come up to the line a little bit tighter, respect the run a little bit more, and it'll give them just like a little bit more room to work around the defensive backfield. Gain of nine on first down, second one from the 39. They throw on second one. Dunn makes the tough catch over the middle. Blaine Bishop pops in, and it's a first down for the Bengals. And, we, you know, I talked about this in the first half. Besides trying to establish a run, they've got to do some ball control passing. This ball thrown to Dunn. Watch the right side of your screen. Just a quick slant. Beautiful job. Though, and and uh, Bishop, Blaine Bishop, a nice job of timing that up and coming in and making a hit. So Dunn moves the chains, as he does so frequently. Relatively quiet crowd here in the Astrodome, though there must be at least seven or 8,000 up here. Blake on first down, looks across the middle and gets it to Hurst. And Hurst, working underneath the coverage, is tackled by Baron Wortham after a gain of about eight. Now, you know, also, you know, looking at that, Jeff Blake had some time, too. Now, we talked about in the first half, he was getting pressure on the outside, but also he's getting pressure in his face. Look here now, the pocket is forming nicely. The offense, the guards on the inside are, are giving him a little room to step up away from the outside rushers, giving him an opportunity to drop the ball up Hurst. Another look at Blake's throw to Hurst underneath. And a game of eight, second down, two to football off the 46-yard line, 12.50 to go in the third. Cincinnati goes back to the running game. First, it stopped short of the first down by Wortham and Robert Young, number 99. Now, but the one thing you have to look at when you talk about
about the running game of the Bengals is, is that all along this has not been the most prolific offensive line in the league. They were a, a very young team early on in the season, very minimal start. Willie Anderson, a rookie, got Rich Graham, he's only been in the, in the league for three years. They get their grills back at center. He's a 10-year vet, so he brings back some veteran uh, play to it, but then they lose Joe Walter. And they're starting the rookie guard, Ken Blackman, at right guard. Walter, as you know, is on the bench, replaced by Tootin today. Has us looking for some options, down 6-0 in the third. We'll be back. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottlers. Dr. Pepper is just what the doctor ordered. By Chrysler and the cab forward sedan of Chrysler. What's new in your world? By Intel, the world's leading maker of microprocessors. And by the adjustable Maverick beard and mustache trimmers from Norelco. In Houston, the Cincinnati Bengals have used a timeout to discuss the play call on third down one as they try to maximize the output on this opening possession of the third quarter. After a completely neutered first half on offense, they gained 24 yards on this drive, a yard more than through the whole first half, and they want the first down. They go well, and he's met at the line of scrimmage by Gary Walker. Tremendous play by number 96. Yeah, it was number 96 finishing it off, but it looked like it, I, I, it's hard to tell. It looked like one of the linebackers really came in low, undercut him, and made the first hit on the on, uh, on the hurt. Well, if somebody else made the first hit, and my spotter's got it wrong, I'm firing them immediately. Okay, let's, let's take a look, look at Bruce Cousins along the sideline as he gets ready to make the call on fourth and one. The Bengals will not punt. They want to sustain this possession. And the spotters survived because they were right. <laughs> Out of the power set, Blake play fakes and throws complete to the tight end, Tony McGee. Marcus Robertson makes the stop, 15-yard game, first down. Tough catch for McGee, who doesn't get that many chances anymore. He, he doesn't get that many chances, but look at the look at the, the play action. They play action hard. That defense just attacked, just absolutely attacked the line of scrimmage. And Marcus Robertson gets caught trying to play catch-up against Tony McGee. McGee has got very good hands. Whenever he's been called on to be the guy, very good hands and makes a snack. Well, he made the game-winning touchdown catch last week against the Ravens and admitted afterward that he worried a little bit with the balls in the air because he just doesn't get that many chance, chances to catch the football anymore. On first down, Blake... Houston rush upon him. Fire intended for Tony McGee again, but this was a matter of getting rid of the ball. Yeah, yeah, this was a miscommunication. They lift up the middle. Others lift up the middle. They went hot. The receiver went inside. Blake thought he was going outside, and thus the ball landed harmlessly in the turf. So the Bengals convert a fourth and one on their opening drive of the third quarter. This by far the best sustained offensive thrust of the game for Cincinnati. They trail 6-0. First half thoroughly dominated by the Oilers. Missed opportunities. Held the lead to only six love. Second down 10. Brian Milne in motion from the fullback position. Hurst split out this time. The throw is in and out of the hands of number 81, Carl Pickens. Blaine Bishop there with covered. Pickens doesn't have a catch today. And, you know, it, it Pickens the guy that, that is a tough player that is going to play for the ball, that is going to make the tough grab. Watch him, you're going to see him as, uh, as they, they've all the receiver kind of slide over to the right to McGee coming, and a uh, very tight coverage. Very, very tight coverage by Blaine Bishop. I like him, just kind of short in, moving back out, Bishop right there to make the play. They had Pickens in the slot, but the broke ball from safety. Bishop Made the play. It'll be third down 10 with the football at the 29 yard line. Done in motion behind Blake. Bat it down. Blaine Bishop again. This time getting a hand on the football off the blitz. They are just, that's decided that we're giving, we are giving Jeff Blake way too much time to start taking control of this offense. Let's go after him. And if anybody's going to send somebody after him, you send Blaine Bishop. He is just a guy that loves to come. He comes up with a blitz, gets up in the air, swats the ball down. Beautiful play. Pelfrey's first attempt of the day. This from 47 yards, Gus Pelfrey. It's the all-time leading field goal accuracy kicker in the history of the NFL. And so, of course, he misses wide right. I mean, it, that's guaranteed. <laughs> I like the absolute lock of the century. Pelfrey said, why does Lampley always have to say that I'm the leading percentage kicker in the history of the league? Forget it, Lamp. <laughs> Doug Pelfrey lamenting the missed field goal with sliced Houston's margin in the game in half. When last season, the team played on October 6th, it was a wild one. Pelfrey had a chance to win the game at the end of regulation, but missed the 40-yard field goal. And in overtime, it was now Cal Greco's 49-yard field goal that won the game for Houston 30-27. And now that we have monumentally embarrassed Pelfrey again, did I mention, Bob, that he's the all-time leading field goal accuracy kicker in the history of the league? Nope. <laughs> well, <laughs> he's surrendering a little bit of his margin with each succeeding kick in front of our eyes. Well, he's talk about. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Eddie George on first down to the Oilers as the Oilers get back to what allowed them to dominate the first half. The excellent running game spearheaded by the rookie star. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, they've got to continue that going. They've got to keep it going because, I mean, look, look at the Oilers. And this was a, a beautiful first half for them. They moved the ball well. Uh, they, they put together some nice drives. The key is here that they were only able to get a couple of field goals. They had the fumble at the end. They had a couple of field goals. They should have put more, some more points on the board. With all the yards, with all the time of possession, they're still sitting 6 nothing, well within reach of the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, truly they're thinking it should have been at least 12 nothing, maybe 16 nothing, instead it's 6 nothing, and Cynthia is still in the game. Chandler's throw is incomplete, intended for the fullback Frank Whitecheck, number 91. For Sanders was also in the area. 
And here's the package of missed opportunities for the Oilers in the first half. The 20-yard field goal missed by Al Del Greco. And then on the first and goal at the five, James Francis has been play on the blitz. And he did exactly what his coach has told him to do. You've got to get a turnover. And you hold him to the first, hold him to a field goal. But if you can, you've got a shot at the ball, you take it. Francis, hey, veteran guy, been around a number of years. Went after it and got the ball. One of the tallest linebackers in the league, one of the best blitzers. Chandler. Rose short, intended for Sanders. That was on third down, 10 from the 37. Ashley Ambrose there on coverage. And so now Reggie Roby will come on to punt the football away for Houston. And the Bengals defense had the answers on that Houston possession. And this last play, not only was uh, was Chris Chandler off target, but you don't watch this play just simple in. And Sanders comes in, ball's thrown low. But also, good play, Ashley Ambrose, good read. And watch uh, Chris Chandler this time, too. Irv Eatman just gets ran over. Just ran him over. And uh, just uh, wiped out Chris Chandler. Roby's second punt of the game, sails high and deep. Dunn will allow it to fall. It takes a Cincinnati bounce back away from their goal line. A 42-yard punt by Roby. Cincy ball in Houston when we come back. This is the NFL on NBC. Christmas Day, join NBC Sports for an exciting NBA doubleheader starting with NBA Showtime at prime time at 5.30 Eastern. First, it's Santa Shack and the Lakers traveling to Phoenix to battle the Sun. And then in Game 2, Grand Hill and the Detroit Pistons make a Christmas voyage to the Windy City to they come Michael Jordan and the extremely harmonious, totally happy together team sending world champion Chicago Bulls. It's called the NBA doubleheader Christmas Day on NBC. Blake, first down, throws over the middle. You pay a price as a receiver in this league. When you go over the middle, Baron Wortham and Joe Bowden sandwiching the tight end, Tony McGee. Um, Baron Wortham still down. He, uh, he got after the hit. Uh, another hit came from the other side and looked like he kind of got bent over backwards a little bit. Well, this is the uh, obligatory double crunch when two tacklers sandwich a, a receiver or a running back and crunch each other into momentary submission. Let's take a look at once again the receiver come across in the middle. You're going to see number 52, Baron Wortham, as he, as he stays right with him. But here comes the hit. And he gets kind of get bent over as uh, Tony McGee gets hit into him. He kind of bends over and looks like he might have twisted his back a little bit. So as they look at number 52, Baron Wortham, again, head coach Jeff Fisher is right there. We'll be back to Houston after this. Back in the Astrodome, Baron Wortham has just walked off the field with help from trainers. He's replaced by Leroy Jones, Jeff Blake, who's missed his last four pass attempts, pulls this one down and elects to fall forward for yardage, and we'll take another look at how Wortham got hurt. Right, that's a little bit scary. You see, he makes contact here. Here comes uh, Joe Bowden from the other side. You can see how his back gets bent. As Tony McGee gets knocked over the top of him right there. Look at that. Look at the back down, the, the, how he gets bent up and twisted. And, you know, you don't know there if it's the back muscle or the abdominal muscle that uh, we're getting uh, twisted. But luckily, he's up and walking, and uh, they're stretching him up. Third down five from the 26. Good time for Blake. Deep oh, down the middle. Another clutch catch by Dunn. If they give him credit, Steve Jackson on the coverage. But Dunn has an amazing knack yeah. for moving the chain on third down for the Bengals. Jim, is this a totally different Bengals team for the first half? I know, hey, it's still early in the third quarter, but at least they're starting to move the ball. They got no huddle going. And Blake tries to go deep on their first no huddle foray and almost has picking for the TD. Darrell Lewis there on the coverage, number 29. Hey, why not? You get the ball down to Dunn, you pick up a big a big gain, he's got some momentum. Why not go no huddle and try and catch the Oilers off guard? Although sometimes when you're not, when you when you try and hurry and start doing those things and, and try to rush the line of scrimmage, sometimes you can get your own guys. Defense had 12 men on the field. However, the offense substituted and quickly snapped the ball, catching the defense with 12 men. Therefore, there is no foul, there is no play. I rule, replay first down. So there's, what happens is, if you're if you're stuck with 12 guys in the field, obviously, you know, here's, here's the extra guy that is trying to get off the field right there. Now, if you've got 12 guys in the field, then you're going to get called. But if the offense does a quick substitution, intentionally trying to catch the defense with 12 guys in the field, then they're not going to allow it. And did, I how, did I tell you how good our spotters are here in Houston? They caught that live on the spot. Yeah, I didn't understand a thing about what they were pointing to on my spotting chart, but <laughs> I know now that that's what they saw. These were whole new signals we've never seen before. Fisher with a little bit of animation. Pickens has been shut out in the game. No catches for Carl Pickens, who was third in the league in receiving coming into this week. I'll tell you what, too, Jim. You know what's embarrassing? When you're that 12th guy. When you know that they've made a substitution, all of a sudden you realize, I'm not supposed to be here. You're running as best you can to get off the field, hoping you don't hear the ball snap. All of a sudden you got the coach on the sidelines going, hurry up, hurry up. Incidentally, with regard to the uh, crowd noise here, or absence of it, Mark Brunel of the Jacksonville Jaguars told me that when he called plays in the huddle here in the Astrodome, he felt as though he had to whisper so that the <laughs> Oilers defenders wouldn't hear him. Seriously, he was whispering to his Jaguar teammate. The Oilers lift, Blake relates to the ball, Pickens makes his first catch of the game. Darryl Lewis helps him out of bounds. Oh, and Darryl Lewis uh, got him out of bounds, but uh, Pickens the sure hand. Darryl Lewis couldn't have come any closer to making a beautiful play. You're going to see him working up here. There's Pick. There's Lewis over there. Or D. Lou, as Chris Dishman calls him. Good reaction. 
makes play of all, but Pickens Pick being a, a big receiver, a tall receiver, can really get out there. And I think what that really helps you play, to be able to lay the ball up and let the size of that of that receiver go up with the ball. Pickens, one of the league's leading fight for the ball guys. On second down six, Lake goes down again. Anthony Cook once again with the pass rush. Cook came in with five sacks on the season. He's had a couple today. Boy, they're gaming it up front. And I asked these guys, I said, what do you do with the uh, quarterback that can move this? We're just going to game. We'll run some games. You see there, Anthony Cook comes up inside, takes the inside pass lane because, uh, lane because Michael Barrett was blitzing on the outside and really just kind of caught the offensive lineman off guard. Couldn't get enough momentum to stop. Anthony Cook from getting in and just getting hands right on Jeff Blake. They're down 11 to 48, seven and a half minutes to go in the third period. Blake with three wide receivers against the Oilers' three-man rush. Oilers playing coverage here. Blake has all the time that. in the world. Not too oh. many targets. Gets done. And once again, Dunn shows his uncanny penchant for moving the chains for Cincinnati. Earlier in the drive, it was a 27-yard catch. Now here's a 24-yard catch. I'll tell you what, and this is ridiculous. I've always hated the three-man rush. rush. One, two, three, you got there. Look at the time he's got. Three guys working against six blockers is not going to get to the quarterback. And eventually a quarterback, especially a guy who can get things done, is going to find the receiver open. One of the guys is going to find some open space and Blake's going to get the ball off. You can't rush with three rushes. Five catches to 75 yards for David Thun, the second-year player out of Fresno State. He's rapidly becoming a third link in the Bengals. Outstanding four of wide receivers. Lane Bishop is coming at Blake again. Second time in three plays. Bishop has put a hit on Blake and Blake releases intended for number eight, David Thun. Not just this drive, but the last drive, too. I mean, Jeff Blake's seeing number 23 more than he's seeing guys in his own team. Tale of the tape. And we'll talk about the size of the Bengal receivers, big guys, yep. as opposed to the Oilers defensive backs, smaller guys. Well, well, you know, and we talked about it. I mean, with Pickens being, you know, this guy's got the height advantage. Jeff Blake, very good at laying the ball off. Oh, oh boy. Joe Bowden, fifth year linebacker out of Oklahoma, helped Garrison Hurst and welcomes him to what has for years been known as the House of Pain. Man, did he get a shot on him. Garrison Hurst comes up into the line and he gets caught around the ankle. You know, watch here as he comes up first. He gets hit around the ankles, that locks his feet up, and here comes Joe Bout, number 58. Boom! Now, I'll tell you what, that was the, that was the perfect tackle. Face of the, you got the face mask and the chest to wrap the arm. Blake fires, completes the gun, and gun on third and 11. That's another first down conversion for Cincinnati. Again. You're right, he hits 24. He hits right. that one. And you know, we come into this game talking about Pickens, talking about Darnay, about David Dunn. We're very sorry. We're very sorry we didn't mention him early in the game, but you're certainly being mentioned now. This is a beautiful job by David Dunn. This has been the David Dunn drive, and you've got six catches now for 98 yards as Dunn performs today in the role of Carl Pickens. Exactly. And sometimes when you when the team starts to focus on a guy like Pickens, that'll free up a guy like David Dunn. First and 10 at the 12, Brian Milne, the rookie fullback out of Penn State, plows forward for a few yards. Enormous personal interest story has beaten Hodgkin's disease to play in that. National Football League. You know, I talked to him yesterday, and he was, he was uh, like I said, Hodgkin, they found a, a tumor the size of a grapefruit by his heart. Now, the, the major thing was, he had pulled a muscle in his back, lifted hay bales. He went to a sports medicine doctor, which was closed at the time. They normally would have just faced it. Because they were closed, he had to go to an orthopedic surgeon, whose, whose protocol was to make an, get an x-ray first. Because of that, they found the tumor and was able to save it. 11th play of the drive, an incompletion from Blake intended to Pickens, and Pickens gives Blake a look as if to say, hey, I've got working room here, put the ball on my numbers. <laughs> Exactly. David Dunn seems to be getting all the good passes. Big. It, it seems to be the guy that I think Jim Blake's saying, hey, he makes a tough catch. Here's another one for you. <laughs> <laughs> Dunn comes back onto the field, incidentally. Can you imagine Baron Wortham back on the field for the Oilers? Oh, he is back yeah. on the field. That is good news, because I'll tell you what, though, the way that hit took place, that was kind of a scare. We, we personally, Jim, have seen a couple of those plays in the last couple of weeks. Well, they, you had the fightful scene involved in Herman Harvey a week ago of the Ravens, the goal line Cincinnati. Back and down, flags go down, play is stopped. You just mentioned the sidelines. You got cops up there going. Before the ball was snapped, ball start by the offense. Number six. Well, that's going to turn third and seven in oh. third and twelve. That's what coaches hate to see, particularly when you've got a chance to take the lead in the ball game. You're exactly right, when you've got a chance. But you just imagine Compton looking over and seeing David Dunn standing next to him and just said, What are you doing here? <laughs> Get out of the field. Get back out there. But no, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, they have they have proven that this is this is the Bengal team that we expected to see. We expected to see two offenses that could move very well. And, uh, you know, but uh, here, take a look at this graphic. 21 to 24 perception. He is definitely the possession guy, the go-to guy for this team. Three third down catches in this five. So, do they go to Dunn again on third and 12? They go to Scott. And it's a touchdown. Or check it, it's James Hunden. James Hunden, a rookie out of Portland State. First catch of the game for Hunden. Touchdown between Jackson and Dishman. And that, I'll tell you, that's hard to stop because he's the last guy you're going to worry about over there on that Oiler defense. Yeah, we I mean, talked about between Pickens and now David. All of a sudden, here's Hunden coming in and making a good, nice job of getting some, uh, using his speed, coming across the middle and getting the separation. But again, Jim, that whole first half, we look at the halftime, how dominating the, uh, the Oilers were. 
compared to the production of the Bengals doesn't matter now. And Pelfrey nails the PAT, so Cincinnati takes the lead. Four minutes, 34 seconds to go in the third period. 7-6 Bengals in Houston. Well, when you've got three catches for 64 yards in the drive, David Dunn, you've got Hunden right there. They go upfield. Now Dunn underneath, frees it. you got Steve Jackson sitting in the slot. He's drawing. He's looking at Dunn. That freezes him just long enough to give Hunden the room to get some free, uh, uh, the free room to catch for the touchdown. His first NFL reception, his first NFL touchdown catch. He was the last guy that the Oilers would have specified as the intended target on the play. 23-yard return of the kick here by Mel Gray. And the Oilers, having completely dominated ball possession and yardage in the first half, find themselves behind 7-6 as the result of James Hunden's first career NFL reception, which gives the Bengals a touchdown. And that scoring drive alone almost matched their time of possession in the first half. They have really changed their offensive production around. Now the key here, too, you look at, and there, there you see Steve Jackson, the guy who, hey, and, 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 and I'm not saying that he blew it. No, he was so done conscious, and he should have been, and he because been. Dunn had been the primary target throughout the drive. And all it takes, though, is that hesitation sometimes to free up a receiver, give the quarterback enough room to throw it. Chandler rolls, throws in the flat to number 88, Roger Lewis. Lewis drops the football as he belted down. Bracey Walker, number 27, there to make the play for the Bengals. And I'll tell you what, as good as the Bengal offense is playing, sometimes all it takes is a little kick in the shorts to get everybody going. Cincinnati's defense seemed to play a little bit more aggressively. Touchdown drive for the Bengals, seven plays, 79 yards, four minutes, 57 seconds. Plus two, Jim, the, the Cincinnati defense also knows that the last time the Oilers had the ball, they stopped them. And they weren't able to do that in the first half. So both sides of the ball for the Bengals feeling better about themselves. Ed Hochuli. So that whole, that whole two-legged takedown didn't count. So they're saying right about there where the forward momentum was stopped was where the ball was placed. So the whole two-legged takedown Loss of the yard, second 11 from the 25. Eddie George with the football, and George is met by James Francis and Bo Orlando. And he goes nowhere. It'll be third down long for the Oilers. Well, the, the defense for the Bengals playing more aggressively now. Where we saw uh, Eddie George being able to stop, hesitate, find a hole, redirect, and accelerate in the first half. Now he can't do that as much. He's got to make his cuts quicker because these guys, this defense is playing more aggressively. They're coming after him. And normally you look at, the, you look at this. Second half of the game is when Eddie George is the guy that steps up and starts to produce. So it's going to be up to him. As we said in the beginning of the game, he's the key to this Oiler offense. Three carries, no yards in the second half so far for Eddie George. So today the pattern for the moment has been reversed. On third down and long, the throw across the middle to Sanders. Sanders has first down yardage and more. Out to the 37-yard line as Ashley Ambrose finally makes the stopple. The stopple. The stop for the Bengals. Nice stopple. They did, I mean, it was... He was stopping and toppling. And, and he just, all he did was drag across. He came right through where the linebackers were sitting, and nobody was there to make the play. He was wide open. James Francis was about the closest guy, but he was about five yards behind him, just trying to chase him down. The numbers on Sanders for today. Came in averaging 19.4 yards per catch. Second in the National Football League behind Henry Ellard of the Redskins. 24 to go in the third period, clock running. First and 10 at the 38-yard line. Willers trailing for the first time in the game, 7-6. Picked off by Francis. Plenty of running room. Eddie George oh. gets blocked. No flag. Touchdown. 32-yard TD return for James Francis who is having a very big game. He is having a huge game. He's had a huge game coming on blitzes. He's had a, a, a pretty good game in coverage. And I'll tell you what, on the return also, watch number 92, he comes up. You're gonna see John Copeland for the Bengals as he's gonna help with the block. Here comes the pass. Francis stepping right in front of the receiver. Watch Copeland 92 come in as you see a bunch of Oilers going to make a play. There's 92, knocks off two Oilers to free up Francis for the touchdown. Right, Wycheck and another player both going down as a result of the big block by Copeland. And now Pelfrey will try to add the extra point. That could give the Bengals an eight-point lead at 14-6 to six with 2.07 to go in the third. 
dramatic reversal in the second half here in Houston of a game dominated in the first half by the Oilers. They didn't take advantage of their opportunities. Cincinnati has capitalized on their chances in the third period. And watch the job here. You see Francis, he's just going to drop into the zone right underneath the route. And they're not even going to... It, it, it looks like he doesn't even see him. He just steps right up. There he goes. He was on the outside. Steps right up right in front of the throw. You're going to see Copeland here, 92. Nice job knocking off two. Both Wycheck and Kevin Donnelly. And a happy Bruce Coslett celebrates the touchdown by James Francis. You know, seventh year, former first round draft choice out of Baylor, one of the rangiest linebackers in the league, Bob, at 6'5 and 252 pounds. And you know what's interesting? Looking back at the end of the at the end of the first half, when we looked at Coslett on the sideline, he didn't look flustered. You know, he didn't look like, you know, here's my Well, team they were very lucky apart. to still be in the game. Exactly. He just looked like, okay, you know, we'll get another shot at it. That's one of the huge differences between success and failure in the Oilers' season. We told you, a 7-7 seven seven team that believes with their talent they could easily have been 10-4 or 11-3 coming into this weekend, but special teams, possession mistakes, errors of that sort have killed them, as you saw. More return TDs allowed than for any other team in the league. And this despite the fact that they have on their roster Mel Gray, one of the greatest returners in the history of football. Flag goes down as Gray goes across midfield into Cincinnati territory at the 47-yard line. The kicker, Lee Johnson, pushed him out of bounds. A hold will bring it back. And, boy, I tell you what, when, when you are a return guy, Mel Gray feeling like he just, he, this is During what they're brought in for. Holding by the receiving team, number 87, 10-yard penalty, first down. When you're brought in to make those plays, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're you get a chance every once in a while to finally break one. Then the penalty occurs, occurs and you want to go back and grab that guy. Well, of course, in Mel Gray's situation, the, the guy you want to grab is much bigger than him. 53-yard return called back. Number 87, you see in the grab right there, that's the hold that they were talking about, had a hold of the sleeve, trying to keep Sam Shade out again, grabbing along the back, really just abusing him, and uh, that wasn't even a close call. Eddie George on first down. George has a gain of about three. It'll be second down seven. Crowd doesn't like the offensive play selection. Turnovers in the game, critical. One of those Houston turnovers prevented a touchdown try on first and goal from the five near the end of the first half. The other becomes a touchdown return for James Francis and Cincinnati living on turnover rate. You know what, and you talk, you show all these stats, and when you show the plus 16, that is an incredible stat. And look at all the other teams. Green Bay, Carolina, and New England. All these are playoff teams. Cincinnati, although they are having a, in the plus 16 range in the ratio. Play 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 well. Chandler gets away from Langford. Oh. Almost throws another interception. In and out of the hands of Timo von Olhofen. And the flag is down. Well, put that on the rush. Chandler hasn't been the most accurate guy in the, in the world today. But with a couple of guys in his face twisting to get out of their grasp, boy, he just laid that one out there. Thank goodness it was a defensive lineman that was going for it. <laughs> you, you got a you know, better chance more often than not. Perfect. He's big drop it. By the offense, number 74, 10 yard penalty, repeat second down. How many Pro Bowls has Bruce Matthews been in? Nine, Nine. right? I don't think he's had any holding calls in the Pro Bowls, though. You're going to see number 74. Oh, the, you know what? That's what it was. It wasn't holding. They got him with tripping. He got t actually got tossed down, which you don't see happen very often. He stuck his foot up to trip the guy. Nice try, Bruce. Second down 17 from the 11-yard line. Things are going from bad to worse for the Oilers as Chandler is chased near the goal line and fires complete to Ronnie Harmon. Harmon making a big play to sustain possession for the Oilers as he did throughout his entire career with the San Diego Chargers. Corey Sawyer on the stop, 22-yard gain, first down Houston. You know what, let's give it to Chandler, let's give it to Harmon, but also Irv Eatman, 75. Watch him right there, follow him. As Chandler gets chased out of the, out of the pocket. By Ricardo McDonald. And, and Big Daddy, he takes out two. Two guys that were chasing Chandler down, giving him the time to dump the ball off to Ronnie Harmon, who really has made his living. He's coming, sneaking out of that backfield, finding an open spot and catching the ball. 
On the Oilers' sideline, Steve McNair may be hankering for playing time, but Chandler momentarily rights himself with that shot to Harmon. Then fires a floater that Chris Sanders can't get to in time, and the pass rush from the Bengals becoming a factor in the second half as it was just before the end of the first half. Hi, Steve. You see Steve McNair there. And once again, let's take a look at the rush. Chandler able to get that ball up, but as he does, once again, he takes a shot, steps up in the pocket to avoid the outside rush, and James Francis one more time gives him a shot in the chest. Homecoming day for James <laughs> Francis. Did you know that he played uh, high school at Lamarck, Texas High School right here in Houston? I know it Born now. in Houston. He's a Houstonian. That's why he's having such a big game today. Showing off. Good for you. Second down, 10 from the 32-yard line. Chandler's going to have to hold on. And that will be the last play of the third quarter as Artie Smith combines with Kimo Van Olhoffen to bring Chandler down, rips the football away. But Cincinnati has ripped the lead away from Houston. We'll be back after the... The fourth quarter arrives in Houston where the Oilers played a brilliant first half but didn't put enough points on the board. And the Bengals have mounted yet another comeback under Coslett in the second half. Hey, he certainly has. And we talked about Eddie George being the second half player. He better step up and live up to the billing now if they're going to have any hope. Third down, 10 yards to go at the 32-yard line. Big down for the Oilers. Now trailing by eight. And the pass is intercepted. Intended for Chris Sanders. Caught by number 31, Greg Myers. That is the 31st interception of the year for the Bengal defense, which leads the National Football League in that category. Second interception in two weeks for the rookie safety, Greg Meyer. And watch Greg Meyer. He's the, he's the safety over on the left-hand side. All he does is sit back, he helps out, comes up, reads the play, and he goes right for the ball. He's not playing the he's not playing Sanders. He's playing the ball. And we talked to Costa. Costa even mentioned him yesterday, uh, yesterday saying he had a great game last, last week also with like 10 or 11 tackles. 29 interceptions coming into the game for Cincinnati. Picks today by Francis, the outside linebacker, and Myers, the reserve free safety, his second interception in two weeks. And now the Bengals have the football back in excellent field position at the 46. And if they were to take this one in for a touchdown, that would just about turn out the light on the Oilers for this season. Baron Wortham makes the stop as Hurst goes on first down for Cincinnati. You know, as, as much as they've been talking about the running game for the Cincinnati Bengals and how much money is out there for the running back, they ain't that good right now. No, they're not using them that they're, much either. They're, they're not using them much. They don't seem to they don't seem to get into a flow between pass and run. It almost seems like the run becomes an afterthought. Like, you know what, let's go run on this play. Well, they've got a young, still somewhat unsettled offensive line. Mm -hmm. They're starting two rookies in the offensive front, Anderson and Blackman. Uh, Rich Bram at left guard doesn't have a lot of experience. And let's face it, their offense is Blake and these three wide receivers, Dunn, Scott, and Pickens. Like that. Dunn over the middle. Gain of eight. Lane Bishop makes the stop. David Dunn now over 100 yards receiving today. And you can talk all you want about Pickens and how great he is, and he is. But Darnay Scott had a 100-plus yard receiving day last week. And now Dunn has one this week. And you see Dunn in motion, number 80. He's just kind of sneaking out late. Hey, get out of my way. Knocks the receiver out. You know, a good attempt by uh, by uh, Chris Dishman to come up and make the play. But the ball was thrown a little bit behind the right to Dunn. Seven receptions, 106 yards. <laughs> having a picking type day. Yep, and Blake calls the timeout here as the Bengals want to maximize this possession. 13-27 to go in the game. A chance to really put the Oilers in the dark for Coughlin and his Bengals. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottler. Dr. Pepper is just what the doctor ordered by Chevrolet trucks, the most dependable, longest-lasting trucks on the road. By KFC, for everything a meal should be, everybody needs a little KFC. And by American Express, help support the American Express Charge Against Hunger program. Jim Lampley along with the fabulous Bobby G. Bob Golick as we bring you back to Houston. The Oilers are in danger of losing for a fifth consecutive time at home. And how big a factor are the empty seats? Hey, they didn't pay for those chairs. And it is. And the player, you want to have people supporting you. And, you know, there's a lot of people saying, well, you know, fans, the 20,000 fans don't cause you to fumble the ball. But you know what? It does affect the mindset of the player. House of pain, house of shame. On third down, Blake throws a dangerous pass intended for Kijana Carter. 
Michael Barrow wasn't fooled and stayed with Kijana, and that will bring up a fourth down situation now for the Bengals. Boy, Michael Barrow with a, a nice job. I tell you, good coverage. You're going to see him over on the left side of your screen. He runs right with Kajana. The only thing is that, hey, he turned around. He would have had a chance to make a play in the ball. But as a linebacker, sometimes you're up against a quick back like that. All you want to do is stay with him, stay close so you can make a play. Doug Belfry. Whenever I'm announcing, this is one of the worst percentage field goal kickers in the history of the league. And he'll be trying a 57-yarder here. Say nothing. I'll just say Zippo. He missed from 47 before. They fake it. And Belfry, oh, no. oh my God. Uh, that's exactly the kind of thing that can turn a game around on you. That is exactly the kind of thing that can suddenly turn a game in your disfavor. And, and Bruce Costell knows that he is not happy. They go with the quick kick. Pelfrey hoping to, to be able to pooch kick it down into the corner to, to, to pin the Oilers back in bad field position. Here comes the snap right to Pelfrey. Now, they've worked on this. And in practice, it worked. Pelfrey knows as soon as he kicked it, that ball went, went up in the air. And constantly, you, you can tell this has not been, you know, this is not going to be go back and let's make uh, let's make nice with a kicker day. No lip reading. No lip reading allowed. This is not pay cable. Well, you know, it, it, that was a four-yard punt by Belfry. <laughs> and it gives the Oilers the football at their 35-yard line when they should have been pinned deep. And they go to Eddie George. And you're right. It can't, something like this can't turn a team, can turn a game around. But the key is here. You've got to get. You've got to be able to have somebody to turn yeah. it around. Well, it's new life for the Oilers if they can do anything with it. If they go down and get a field goal, they're back in the game with plenty of time exactly. to go. Exactly. Second half, though, Eddie George hasn't been able to find the hole. Chris Chandler has been throwing. He's been off with his targets. He's been throwing low. He's been, uh, you know, when the comeback routes the receivers, he's throwing it farther than these guys are even coming back. Second down five. Complete to Sanders, first down yardage for the Oilers, first sign of life for the Oilers offensively on this drive. Jimmy Spencer there to make the tackle for the Bengals. Ten-yard pickup, first down. You know, that's the first piece of good news for Fisher in a while, other than, other than that you'll be encasing your license plate in a University of Southern California license plate holder for the rest of this year. Is that right, Bob? I wondered when you'd bring that up. Did you see McNair's numbers? Jeff Fisher. Yeah, me and Jeff Fisher, yeah, we, we had a little wager over our alma maters this year, Notre Dame, USC. I have a feeling that you know, USC... Well, a lot of people thought that the biggest thing about SC's win was to save John Robinson's job. Eddie George breaks through for a gain of about 10. Bo Orlando is there to make the stop for the Bengals. But this looks as though it can move the chains once again for Houston, or at least come close. Uh, Eddie George has found his form for the first half. Watch, he's just going to start outside kind of a sprint draw where they start toward, toward the sideline looks up field uses his vision he finds the hole and like i said for a guy his size that explosiveness is just impressive the numbers on george for today not a particularly huge game in the last game between these two teams 26 carries 152 yards now 23 carries 67 yards Artie smith makes the stop it was second and one it will now be third down and and two you know, and, and the thing is, as, as yeah, as Eddie George does not have a good a good run. The, the key was, even though he doesn't have the yardage, even though it's 22, 22 carries for for 66 yards, or 23 even, for 65, or, or something like that. Something like that. Even though it's that he he got the yardage that he needed at the right time. He was there with the good runs to get the first down. In the first, first down, down, two yards to go, and George fights for yardage and finds his way to the first down. Bo Orlando holding on for the tackle, but that was a professional piece of running by Eddie George. Well, I'll tell you what, with one, if it continues from here, if, if the Oilers are able to bounce back and get back on track, I'll tell you what, there's, there's going to be a kicker looking for work. Not like that's ever been. No, 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 Doug Pelfrey will not be looking for work because he is, as I told you, the leading percentage field goal kicker <laughs> in the history of the NFL. <laughs> Even though he does only well, horrible then, things whenever you and I are around. Well, then he'll have a good resume. Chandler falls down, gets up. Chase, but gets away from Morabito. And makes something out of it. Turning disaster into about a three-yard game. So, so you and Fisher bet on the Notre Dame Southern Cal game. Yeah. And because his Trojans beat your Irish, your license plate in Los Angeles is going to say... I, it's going to say USC Trojans. <laughs> he, he was nice enough to purchase it for him. It's a, one of those license plate holders. It goes around the license plate. 
was going to say, USC Trojans. I got, in fact, okay, I, let's got, do it. I got it sitting right here. Did you bring the Black & Decker also? Here it is right there. There's the thing. And he was nice enough also. There, USC. I think our viewers can see that. He yeah, gave me a screwdriver good. too. USC. Beautiful. <laughs> to make sure I had no problem Leaving putting it no on. stone unturned. Chandler fires. Complete. To Frank Wycheck. Wycheck is captured by Tom Tumulty. And this will bring up third down and about a yard to go for the first down. Nice guy. And, you know, White Chick's always that guy that, that you, you kind of forget about him for a while. You know, he goes out there, he blocks, he works hard. You throw the ball to the other receivers, you give the ball to Eddie George. Every once in a while, then you need the yardage. Hey, find White Chick. Fourth-year player out of Maryland, former Redskin. Now huge play for the Oilers as they try to get back into it. Third down one. Eddie George, first down, Houston. Pounds it down to the 25-yard line. No tip, no tiptoe in there. He now the Oilers are in field goal range, and the key here becomes maintain possession, don't turn it over again. Exactly, and you know what, and they'd love to continue down, change their fortunes of luck from the first half and actually score a touchdown, but the reality is even if they get a, a touchdown, they're still going to need an extra fi a field goal to, uh, to take the lead. They'll be down 14-13. So they've got to they're gonna try and change what they did in the first half, continue through the red zone this time. Chandler fumbles the snap for the second time and oh. throws it into the hands of Francis. And Francis has another interception, his second of the day. What a homecoming for Houston's own James Francis. And this tiny crowd will make its presence felt for Chris Chandler. What? It, 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 watch. Chandler loses the ball, kind of trips up. Here he just gets the, the dumps the ball off, and John Copeland, number 92, gets a hand up, deflects off his hand right into the hands of James Francis. 19-yard return of the interception by Francis, and just as the four-yard punt gave momentum to the Oilers, this gives it back to Cincinnati. And you know what? The people are going to want, and they're, they're booing Chandler. They're going to come down on him. But that was a good play by a defensive lineman. It comes off the hand. There's nothing Chandler can do about it. The, ball, the hand came out late. And any time a defensive lineman slaps at the ball, it, it's half luck. On first down for the Bengals. They go with Garrison Hurst. And it's one of the most productive running plays of the day for the Bengals. Garrison with a gain of about nine. Marcus Robertson makes the stop. Bengals Oilers. December of 1972, as you think of James Francis and his two key interceptions today, the Bengals' Lamar Parrish had quite a game, intercepting not one but two passes against Charlie Johnson and returning them both for touchdowns. It is the only time, I repeat, it is the only time a player has ever victimized the Oilers twice in a game for interception return touchdowns. The Bengals won that game by the relatively modest score of 61 to 17. Second down. Hurst looking to move the chain or check it. It's Eric Bieniemy, the third down back. He's close to a first down. Let's check in with Greg Gumbel in New York. All right, Jim. Colts Chiefs, a game filled with playoff implications. An Indy field goal made it a seven-point lead for the Colts, but Tamaric Vanover returns the kickoff 70 yards. However, the Chiefs could get no closer than the Colts' seven-yard line. They settled for a field goal. 17-13 is the score. An Indy win plus an Oiler loss would eliminate Houston from the postseason chase. Jim? All right, Greg, so that's the prospect facing the Oilers right now as they trail 14-6 with still 7-0-4 to go. Keechana Carter with the football on first down, and Carter, with his biggest contribution of the day, has a gain of about nine before Dixman and Robertson makes the stop. Well, defensively, the Oilers have to realize that they've only got a little over six minutes, about six and a half minutes left to stop, get the ball back, and, uh, and get the points on the board. Look at Gordon Johnny score twice exactly Kajana Carter able to uh, pound his way up there didn't even pound it I mean that that hole was wide open he just weaved a little bit found his way through so they got a score then they're gonna have to uh, go for two yeah score once get a two-point conversion that would tie the game got to score twice to win it Kajana Carter with a big run there on first and ten after Carter was able to move the chain Blake breaks out and has yardage inside the 20 down to the 17 yard line Huge play by Jeff Blake, and the first time that he's been able to break the Oilers' containment and get out of there all day. Hey boy, he did a nice job, too. They were so spread. Number 50, 
56, Michael Barrow. And look at Pickens, too. Pickens, uh, he was able to find himself a little bit of a little bit of freedom as he just kind of coasted into the end zone. But at that point, Jeff Blake was being chased by enough. Michael Barrow was the first one at him. And at this point, just kind of like weaved his way up the field and a, a bunch of angry defenders chasing him downfield. Very weird day for the Bengals. Pickens has one catch for four yards. Darnay Scott has no catches since he stands to win the game. There's the second catch of the game for Pickens if they rule it a forward pass. And Darrell Lewis is there with the coverage and the stop. And nice job by, by Blake that time to get the ball off on a hot throw. Pickens uh, very aware. Gets the read, the quick throw, because the inside backers were coming. 52, Michael or Baron Wortham. Watch it. He's coming right up the middle. In fact, he's going to get his hands right on Blake as he lets go to the ball. But like I said, the communication, Pickens sees the, the blitz coming. He adjusts to the hot route, and Blake gets the ball out to him. Second catch of the game for Pickens. Gain of five yards. So he's got two catches for nine yards. And it's second down four. And make it a gain of six. Second down four at the 12. 4.54 to go. Flags down as they give it to the fullback, Brian Milne. Marcus Robertson on the tackle. And they're they're, they're uh, indicating offside against the Houston Oilers. And boy, you know, so many things were going right in the first half offensively. And as a team for the Oilers, now they're not only are the Bengals able to get some something going. Offside of the defense, number 56 of the defense. Five-yard penalty results in a first down. But Michael Barrow steps up, maybe gets a little aggressive, lines up, gets into the neutral zone. And because of that, automatic first, not automatic first down, but enough yardage for the first down. You're going you to see him down at the bottom of your screen, right down in here, just lurching, gets over into the neutral zone, doesn't get back in time. Story here looks pretty obvious, Bob. The Bengals got what they needed at midseason, a coach that the players wanted to play for. The Oilers need an exit visa out of their lame duck status here in Houston. It's, it's obvious. Blake trying to put the capper on a possible Bengals victory here. Garrison Hurst wrapped up by Robertson and Barrow. Oilers need a big play, not just in terms of stopping Cincinnati, they need to regain possession. And you know what, Jim, the sad thing is, is that it, Almost everybody wants the Oilers out of Houston now, except the politicians. The fans obviously would like to see, hey, if you're going, then get get the heck out of here. The players are sitting there, I, you know, the players want to go now. They didn't know in the beginning, but now they're sitting there going, well, we can't play in front of 1,500 people, 20,000 people. Guys are sitting in the locker room after practice chatting about where they're going to live in Nashville. Exactly. The only they sent the wives to look for houses and what have you. And the only people holding this back are the politicians who just don't want to let it go. Well, that, of course, has to do with money, Bob. <laughs> really? <laughs> From the eight, the give is to Hurst. The Oilers are looking for the run. And they wrap him up. Marcus Robertson and Robert Young are there. Bengals are playing it safe because a field goal would put this one out of reach. Or at least would appear to put it reasonably out of reach. You know, you never, you never can rule out a possible miracle in the National Football League. In Houston, an unhappy day for starter Chris Chandler, who's going to give the ball to Steve McNair for this next possession. And Steve, then you see that I'm going to say, hey, Steve, you know, I, I, I didn't really leave you much hope, did I? Sorry about that, but go in there and get the save. 16 of 29, 178 yards. The three interceptions for Chandler on the last three Oiler possessions. And some fans would sit out there and say, well, he was one possession too late in lifting Chandler and no. substituting McNair. But most coaches would have done what Fisher did. No, Chandler is the reliable one. He is the guy that you can count on. Today was, a, was an anomaly for him. He's not normally like this. And plus, the last interception, remember, was a tip ball by John Copeland. Reese Walker makes the stop downfield on Mel Gray, and now McNair will come onto the field after what has been a dominant second half for Cincinnati following a first half in which Houston didn't take advantage of its opportunity. Total, op total opposite. Cincinnati came out there, and I think that's what Costle told him. He said, hey, you know what happened? With the, as bad as we played in the first half, as little yard as we put together in the first After half, the play, it doesn't going. matter. Continuing action, unsportsmanlike conduct by the receiving team number 21. Threw the ball on a player's face. Mel Gray first threw the ball on a player's face. Yard penalty, half the distance to the goal. 11-yard veteran or 11-year veteran out of Purdue. And and Jim, I, I, you know, I don't want to mention this. We lost one of the referees. 
one, of, one of the referees had to leave. He uh, just came out the field. He was sick. And uh, as bad as it sounds, actually, look, I think that he uh, kind of lost lunch out there on the field. Is that necessary? Well, I'm just, I'm just pointing out because the, the guys are kind of playing in that area. I'm not sure it was necessary. From the more information than you need category, brought to you by Bob Bullock. McNair on his first call. Oh. And Chandler sits along the sideline and says, see, <laughs> it wasn't that easy today. <laughs> Corey saw your number 23 is in there on the Nickelback Blitz to pick up the sack. It, it wasn't just me. No, he, they, he got in there. Sawyer got down. And, and watch it. He's going to come on the Blitz. And what he does is he gets down low and ends up on the ground grabbing and holding on to. That's Kimo von Allhoffen has McNair's ankle with Sawyer coming over the top to finish him off because, well, McNair couldn't go anywhere. From basketball, the term garbage time, this is it. 12 yard pickup, McNair to Wycheck, clock running, three minutes, 21 to six, Cincinnati. Only a miracle could get Houston back into the game, and under these circumstances, with a crowd of about 19 people sitting in the stands, it's hard to envision that miracle. Yeah, and, they, and they're not utilizing the clock that well. Obviously, they're going no huddle, but uh, here's uh, the, the first time they're actually going to the sidelines. Willie Davis belted out of bounds by Corey Sawyer. Officials are going to rule incomplete. And Davis is disgusted with that. Fisher's had a rough day, and the Oilers can't wait to get to Tennessee, and they might have to wait another year. And they may have to play the whole next season. Like I said, at this point, they just have to, everybody has to say, this is a done deal. The team's not staying. Let them go. The players don't want to play in front of an empty stadium. The fans, all they want to do is yell at them. And uh, so just let these guys go, let them move on so we can stop having a lame duck team. Oilers going for it on fourth and two from the 19. They're two of two on fourth downs today, and they make a good call here, getting the football to Rodney Thomas with a lot of running room, and he gets across the 30 to pick up the first down and a little unnecessarily energetic <laughs> vociferous uh, Kevin there from Bo Orlando. Well, Ke Kevin Donnelly had come downfield to continue blocking and uh, Bo Orlando took a little bit of a offense in the fact that... And uh, Kevin said, shall I show you some of my Taekwondo <laughs> techniques? Didn't we used to be teammates? McNair over the middle of Wycheck. And Wycheck adds to his numbers on the season. He's the surprise leading receiver for the Oilers. Tom Timulty, the middle linebacker, made the stop. I'm going to warn you, Bob Golick, and you better Two get minutes this again, warning. huh? There are only two minutes left in the game. <laughs> I'm warning you. I knew it that time. Tough season continues for the Houston Oilers. 7-7 seven and seven coming into today and still with a chance to make the playoffs. But that chance rapidly slipping away now for Jeff Fisher and his team. Chris Chandler watches from the sideline after three interceptions. And Steve McNair does the heavy work here in the closing minutes against the Bengals. A good throw by McNair. Caught by Chris Sanders. 17-yard gain and a first down for the Oilers. Well, other than the fact there's only about a minute and 40 left, uh, they're, they're moving the ball pretty well. As you said, Jim, they're going to have to get the ball if, if they have any hope. And, and it doesn't look at this point like they're going to lay the ball down. It looks like they're going to try and get a score, but settle at that. Houston finishes it out on the road next week. I check with the catch. Oh, and he stays in. Finally wrestled down by Corey Sawyer as he stays in bounds. Clock will run with 123, 122, 120. I do that pretty well. He, he, <laughs> he keeps changing, Jim, let me tell you. 116. <laughs> Hard yeah. to keep up with that. You know, Greg Gumbel is filled with fabulous information in New York. Let's go to him right now. Greg, a Every one of Jim. Jim, we told you earlier, if Houston loses and Indy wins, the Oilers are out. Well, if Indy wins, the Bengals are out. And Jim Harbaugh continues to light it up. His third touchdown pass of the day to Marvin Harrison. Two minutes to play at Kansas City. 24-13 Colts, Jim. Colts are a gutty ball club. Thank you, Greg Gumbel and Bob Golick. You and I will be seeing those same Colts next week as they try to nail down a playoff berth in Cincinnati. But the Bengals will be hoping to finish 8-8. Eight and eight. And under Bruce Costler, be able to take it home, finish the season at home, end up at 500 after the horrendous start they had this season. 
That is not going to be an easy game for the Colts. Eight and eight for Cincinnati would mean seven and two under Coslett. He came into that brand new contract today with some pretty good leverage based on what this team is doing for him. McNair looking to the end zone and almost an interception for Jimmy Spencer. Chris Sanders was the intended receiver. And this is what the Oilers needed coming into today to make the playoff. This was a very plausible scenario. This was a plausible scenario. They had already had the Chargers lose yesterday. All they had to have was, was two of the three on the bottom to take place. It could have happened. Buffalo losing two, maybe not. But the other two, very, very possible. But that is all gone now. The Oilers came out in the second half, played as if those scenarios didn't even exist. The Bengals, on the other hand, we told you about their playoff chances, almost nil playing great ball in the second half of this game. They're down 10. McNair hoping to put something on the board in his tour of duty here. Keeps the football and scrambles downfield effectively to pick up a first down as the clock passes the one minute mark. Artie Smith made the tackle after a 12 yard pickup by McNair and there's a timeout on the field. And we'll be back to Houston for the NFL on NBC and the conclusion of this game right after these upcoming messages. 54 seconds to go in the Astrodome, and we remind you that following the game on most of these stations, it's Dateline Sunday, then the Musty Comedy's Third Rock from the Sun in Boston Common, followed by that network premiere Western Lightning Jack. That's tonight on NBC. Viewers on the West Coast will see these shows at their regularly scheduled times. I don't know how Cuba Gooding Jr. got that part when he has no lines in it. Cuba Gooding Jr.? Cuba Gooding Jr.? Cuba Gooding Jr. Cuba. Cuba C. Pass is to Rodney Thomas from Steve McNair. Thomas stops the clock, stepping out of bounds. Andre Collins there to chase him out for the Bengals as some Bengals defensive reserves are on the field. The executive producer of NBC Sports is Tommy Roy. The coordinating director of the NFL on NBC, John Gonzalez. Today's game produced by Ed Fibershaw, directed by Doug Drabert. The NFL on NBC pregame and halftime shows produced by Ricky Diamond, directed by John Gilmartin, associate director Molly Solomon. She's great. Production associate Peter Radovic. And in case for some reason you have not been reading USA Today in the past 10 years, the president of NBC Sports <laughs> is Dick Ebersole. Second down three with the football inside the 20, and McNair hoping to put a touchdown on the board, and Rodney Thomas can't hold on. Yeah, but Corey he saw you there on the coverage. He kept the ball out of Corey Sawyer's hands. Corey came flying up there. He had that ball all locked in on his sights. And then, uh, then Rodney Thomas was able to knock it away. Watch the ball is going to get thrown out into the right flat. Thomas coming out of the backfield. There's the ball off of Thomas' hand. Sawyer right there. And if, it, if Rodney Thomas doesn't knock that ball away, Corey Sawyer is making this a 28-6 game. Not that another seven is going to matter at this point. Third down three at the 16. Slot right formation. Three wide receivers for McNair. In the end zone, touchdown! Frank Whitecheck. He's going to catch it. More grist for the mill of those who might criticize Fisher for not pulling Chandler earlier and mm -hmm. putting McNair in in the second half. Yeah, you know, it, but, but again, we, we, we reiterate, you know, the, the, what happened on that last interception of, uh, of Chandler's was not his. There's a ball, just a beautiful throw. I mean, that, thing was, yeah. that was like laid up right there. Wycheck, uh, a good sized guy, able to go reach up and make the play, but uh, did a nice job of finding an open spot. But again, the last interception, not Chandler's fault. Remember, it was tipped by John Copeland. Wycheck, five catches for 57 yards, and that TD. Small amount of solace for the Oilers, and Wycheck apparently intends to keep the ball. And with it, a probable loss. Steve McNair on the touchdown drive for the Oilers, 6 to 10, 71 yards for the TD. What a difference it might have been this year had it not been for a couple of calamitous plays, Bob. Exactly right. In fact, we were at this game, Jim, and right there it was the field goal that was going to end that game blocked by the Seattle Seahawks for a touchdown. They win it 23-16. Then the Miami Dolphins, Zach Thomas, the rookie sensation, a middle linebacker for the Dolphins, snagging that 
not just an interception, but for a touchdown. And I'll tell you what, those two, those two plays really have, have hurt the, the psyche of this Oiler team. Those were games that the Oilers felt like they were going to win coming down the stretch. Those dramatic turns of events caused them to wind up with losses. So today they came in 7-7 seven and seven instead of potentially 9-5. and five. And you've seen that under today's circumstances, unusually enough, it appeared that the Bengals felt they had more to play for than did the Oilers. Onside kick try now by Del Greco. Skillfully handled by the Bengals. And David Dunn, I'll tell you what, when there's a crowd around and the ball is up for grabs, put your money on number 80 of the Bengals. Well, talk about sure-handed, because you normally see in those, they call it the hands team when you're out there. They want to get the sure-handed people out in a position to make the play. And uh, David Dunn, boy, certainly has today and in the past, and especially today, really shown himself as being Mr. Sure handed today. Seven catches, 104 yards. What a day for him. And four big catches on the drive that produced the touchdown that put them ahead in the ball game. He he really was as much the difference as anyone else. And I one over, and I went over the middle too, Jim. It just it was kind of like a one-handed snag. Really like laid out, made the grab, and something like that really spurs the team. Announced attendance here today, 15,131. There were three games this year when the Oilers did achieve a reasonable turnout of fans here in the Astrodome. They played Pittsburgh and won before 50,000 and 56,000 showed up to see them play San Francisco and lose a close one. And when they lost that game to Miami, there were 59,000 fans here. And remember the Pittsburgh game too, Jim? Remember after they, they, they won that game, they went to the locker room, then Jeff Fisher had the team come back out. And they actually went around and shook hands with the fans, kind of form some sort of a bond which obviously didn't take I mean, the bonds can be forgotten pretty quickly when the losses start happening james francis huge hero today for the bengals Welcome two home. interceptions forced to fumble near the end of the first half that prevented the oilers from going into the locker room with a lead bigger than six nothing ultimately he dunn blake a few of the others contributed mightily to the difference in the game for the final score, Cincy 21, Houston 13. Let's send you to Dick Enberg, Paul McGuire, and Phil Sims for the conclusion of Oakland and Denver.